and uh, welcome. Um, the first thing is uh, apologies. So I've got a, a, a few apologies. We've got apologies um, uh, from Councillor Cotter and apologies from Councillor Daniels for lateness. Who's just walked in, so you can take that out. Just an apology from Councillor Cotter. Um, and uh, I'll move that, seconded by Jimmy Chen. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Um, and uh, we now move. Oh, and I'd like to um, just uh, have a, um, a resolution to accept all the written submissions on the draft long term plan. We have a mixture of submissions today. Uh, just to um, uh, confirm that in, in our uh, record of proceedings. So I'd like to move that we accept the written submissions, including any late submissions uh, received on the draft long-term plan 2021-2031, seconded by Sarah Templeton. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. And so now we'll move on to the um, hearing of the submissions. And as I say, they sort of mix between um, climate change and, um, and, and long-term plans. So I'd like to invite Ruth Shah to come forward. Kia ora and welcome. Oh. But I am, we um, did a joint presentation, so um, I'm Jo Robertson. Yeah, so I'm speaking on behalf of our presentation. All right, so um, I'm representing parents and residents of the Addington community, and um, we've come together this year as a group because we're concerned about the safety of Brougham Street. So I've been to various things and talked to some of you before about this. Um, so Brougham Street, State Highway 76, cuts through our community, and the volume of traffic on that means it um, separates our community and makes it a dangerous space for us as we walk our children to school and back and go shopping. We have a lot of vulnerable people in our community. So that's the background to why we're submitting. So in terms of climate change, we really support that emphasis on sustainability and we support what you're doing. We would like to see changes to the whole transport system um, and a transport system that prioritises people over vehicles. So we'd love to see cars de-emphasised, including electric cars. So electric cars are still cars. So switching one car to another car won't change things for our community and it's the dangers on the roads. Um, we'd love to see effort put into infrastructure that encourages active transport, so scooters, bikes, um, walking. We'd love to see a mode shift for our freight off our roads onto trains so that we are removing trucks and the pollution, the danger that they bring off our roads. And um, we really support the efforts towards commuter bus services, so more frequent, cheaper, more accessible bus services. We think all those things would make a difference to um, the sustainability of our city, but they would also make a real difference to our communities. They make our communities better places to live, more accessible, easier to get around, and they're supporting our vulnerable people who don't necessarily have access to cars, who walk our streets, and we need those communities to be safe. So the, the other big thing we talked about was around justice issues. So just briefly, we would love you to think about justice issues in the world beyond us. So shifting to things like electric cars and electric vehicles um, means somebody overseas is making those, mining the minerals for them. Who are they? How are they being treated? Um, just by switching to electric vehicles means we haven't necessarily solved sustainability issues worldwide. So, thanks. Thank you very much. And I did note your um, comments about the 880 um, yes. city approach yeah. too. And, yes. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, Tom. Yeah, um, and we've worked with, you know, with regards to Addington School. Do you know how Waltham, because that's another school very close to Brougham Street and who's a, um, a neighbourhood cut in half by it many years ago. Do you know how they are faring with regards to their concerns with Brougham Street? Their situation is very, very similar to ours yes. in that the Brougham Street has cut straight through our communities 
and half of us live on one side and half on the other. So the same thing, if there's just such a huge volume of traffic that means both Addington and Waltham are vulnerable communities with a lot of vulnerable people. And the, emphasis, yeah. the transport system that we have now means that our vulnerable people are really disadvantaged in that system. It's hard for us to cross the roads and connect together and build, um, build tight communities. Yeah. yeah, so Waltham is very similar. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. But, yeah, no, thank you very much for your um, submission. Mm. We're very mindful of the challenges of having a state highway um, dissecting, bisecting the city um, and, and, and the way that it does and it, the impact it has on communities. So thank you very much for raising that in the context of the climate change submission uh, strategy. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the next is uh, Lee Robinson, representing Robinson's Bay Ratepayers and Residents Association, as well as a personal submission. Yeah, I can also speak on the other lines. Oh, and I've now been told that you are, oh, yes, and I should have read this, you're speaking on behalf of Ross Blank's um, submission 1071 as well. Thanks, Your Worship. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I have with me Chris Moore, who's on our association as well, who has a submission. So I've already lodged the submission on behalf of the, of the association and I will simply speak to this and make the following points. For 20 years, Akarara has suffered water shortages and the council in our view has done nothing to redress it. Pleas such as requesting council to impose a condition that water storage tanks be installed by residents on building permit applications has for years fallen on deaf ears. <clears throat> in the summer months, water shortages have become the norm. Here we are a month <coughs> off the shortest stay and there are still watering restrictions at the highest level being imposed in Akaroa. People have developed properties with landscaping covenants and requirements to maintain aesthetic gardens and landscaping plans are forbidden by the same regulatory authority from watering them, and they are simply dying. We know as a matter of fact that 69% and possibly up to 80% of the wastewater system that accumulates in the wastewater pipes is ground or stormwater. And yet we have no, we have the council building a massive infrastructure for a cost of $70 million, and we know it'll be more, to take more than two-thirds of the usable and potentially potable water into a sewerage system. In our view, it is madness. The new water services bill that is before Parliament and will become law in the next two or three years will require national standards as to how we deal with water, save it and utilise it. This proposal by the Council is yet another short-sighted stopgap measure without taking a look at the entire larger picture. Filtration is going to be the way to go if we look at countries in the States and, and what happens in Israel, and I'll come to that in a minute. In my youth, I remember the then Mayor of Auckland, Sir Dovemeyer Robinson, thumping the table at City Council meetings, warning his own Council that if they didn't act and install light rail or other alternative transportation systems in Auckland, in 50 years' time, Auckland transport would be a mess how right he was. And yet 50 years later we have a territorial authority again failing to look at the big picture and put in place a long-term plan. Again in my youth we were met at the entrance to Akara, this, this province's playground, by a, dump, by a rubbish dump, seagulls, stench, smoke and nothing short of an eyesore. And now we have a council having consented a waste disposal unit eight metres high sitting in the same place on Akaroa's waterfront. How short-sighted is this council in imposing that position. Together with sewerage ponds at the top of the hill before you descend into the playground of Akaroa Bay. Israel reproduces 75% of its wastewater as potable water for its community and its citizens. And yet we continue to muddle on, spend money on expensive infrastructure that in 10 or 15 years time is going to be a white elephant. Quite apart from the above issues, the proposal involves placing a massive storage tank up the valley at the head of a harbour on the, on, the on the supposed pretext that it's going to irrigate native trees. The evidence before the council hearing that manuka, kanuka and other large native trees that are intended to form a canopy and therefore dissipate heavy rainfall and avoid saturation of soils was clearly those evidence that those trees and species will not survive because of the nitrates in the soil from the water, wastewater irrigation. And we saw that from a test done on uh, a, a plot of natives in, in Devotional. The whole purpose of the planting and lost and it failed. And it fails, the point was completely ignored. 
nitrates will end up in the ground, they'll end up in the inner harbour and it'll be affecting fishing and white bait stocks for which this bay is well known. The plea of the, the association is simply this, council use common sense, fix the infrastructure, get rid of 69 to 70% of good water in the underground water pipes and by the time you've done that there will probably be a water services bill that will provide nat national standards for saving water and dealing with our wastewater properly and we will have further water supply to cover the shortages that already exist. We are not advocating returning to the insulting practice of disposing untreated or poorly treated wastewater into the harbour. What we are advocating is for the Council to take a long-term view for, for a change and serve our communities properly. Thank you. So I just want to re-emphasise a couple of key points that is included in Lee's commentary there. The first is Akaroa Wastewater. So recently the Council approved the Akaroa Wastewater Project and in that approval it resolved that an 80% reduction in I and I be achieved. The current budget does not reflect that decision. The money previously budgeted for a 20% reduction is now being expected to produce that 80% reduction. That's impossible. Therefore, we urge Council to increase the budget to the appropriate level to allow the pipe network to be repaired so that Council's expectations on the 80% reduction in I and I can be achieved, which will then result in lower capital cost overall and also quickly improve the health of Akaroa Harbour. Mm. The second point I just want to dwell on briefly is the Akaroa drinking water. And as we all know, Akaroa has had a terrible summer. In fact, for the last 20 years has had terrible summers. Therefore, we urge Council to immediately put in place a plan for groundwater exploration and drilling for wells around the inner harbour. This must be a high priority and the necessary funding <coughs> should be allocated immediately. Community consultation has shown overwhelming support for the reuse of wastewater to augment Akaroa's water supply. The third point is the Akaroa Service Centre and that we are against the proposed closure of the Akaroa Service Centre. This provides an important service to the Akaroa community and makes no sense at all to close it. The fourth point was the land drainage targeted rate, which we are also against, primarily because there was no information given as to what impact it would be on our current rates. Until we know that the financial impact on it, until we know that financial impact on our current rates, we are not in a position to say one way or the other. Please. If I could just go on to Mr Blank's submission. Yep, please, please. So um, Ross is a retired veterinary surgeon who's lived and worked in Christchurch for 30 years. He is saying that there's compelling evidence that what is proposed is an old technology approach in a world of climate change. As a ratepayer whose annual rates bill is around $50,000, I want effective rigour, due diligence and oversight applied to how my dollar is spent. The most cost-effective option for Akaroa wastewater is wastewater clean-up and harbour outfall. The positives of a modernised harbour outfall option have not been clearly, trans clearly and transparently communicated to the public. I consulted an expat New Zealander working in a wastewater management field in the United States. He assured me the technology to clean up wastewater to drinkable standard is now commonplace through a filter system that is effectively a man-made equivalent of a wetland. Cities and towns on big rivers in the United States reuse and reuse the water multiple times for drinking and general use. If council working groups are instructed to add weight to submissions from local iwi, then transparency about the percentage of that weighting would be useful. That weighting should be one part of a community objective of spending our collective money on the most intelligent, cost-effective and future-proofed option for Akaroa's water reticulation problems. I'm aware that a wetland is incorporated into the Council's current wastewater plan to allow for accidental water flow, overflow, water, wastewater overflow to funnel through a wetland to Children's Bay. My plea is to the Council to consult further with the iwi on the possibility of achieving cultural acceptance to the idea that a man-made wetland, as alluded to earlier, filtration plant, might be an acceptable alternative culturally via a long harbour outfall that would be environmentally safer option than piping the wastewater up to a shallower harbour where there is less tidal cleansing and the effect of a catastrophic weather event 
causing overflow. It might also be a culturally acceptable way of being able to reuse the water if everyone can accept the point that I'm making, which is that a membrane filtration is essentially a mechanical wetland. The wastewater network must be fixed first to avoid an almost inevitable catastrophic overflow which will occur as long as 70% of the water flow in the system is leaking into the wastewater from stormwater. There is no excuse for not capturing the cleaned up grey water for secondary use in Akaroa. Water shortages are already with us. Already native plantings and gardens are dying at some economic cost to ratepayers and the community. Thank you. This, um, we, we, this issue was raised um, in the context of our submission on the um, water services bill, and I, I must have missed something, but I understood that we weren't legally allowed to introduce, for example, the purple pipe system, which would have the impact of um, reducing the uh, significance of the impact of the changes. So, sorry, sorry, I just missed that last bit. You know? Well, that, 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 I mean, that would make a huge difference if we were able to introduce a purple pipe system. But I, I, I was under the impression that there was a legal barrier to that. At, at the moment there is, but there are still submissions being heard on this bill. We made a submission on yeah, this. We yeah. advocated for it strongly. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, look, the long-term view must be that we need to preserve our water. I agree. Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't simply be dumping it up a valley and, and just disposing of it like this. It, that we need to take a long-term view. And within two or three years, we believe that there will be some answers. There's got to be some answers. There's there, got there to be some be. answers. I mean, to, we're operating yeah. under a time frame, and there's multiple time frames. And <clears> I mean, I don't want to sidetrack onto the broader issue, which is not the subject for the LTP. But, um, uh, well, I am traversing the broader subject, which is not part of the LTP, so I won't do that. But, um, I mean, I agree entirely, and the council um, backed a submission to central government <coughs> for precisely that purpose. Um, but you're saying that within the time frame of implementation, we should be able to um, see a change in the law. Well, look, if something happened tomorrow, this thing's not going to change till 2028. Yeah. That, that's when it will come into, come into to being, you know, from, a, from an operational perspective. So we do have time, and... Are we going to spend 70 plus million in the meantime? Right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, Sarah's got a better memory of this yep. the detail than I have, but yep. it, it is that. Would you like to switch your microphone on and repeat that? We did pass a resolution yeah, as no, part of the, the council that, that said that if things change, that's right. that staff had to come back straight and away. And that's why yeah. we urge council to uh, to make that submission to the we parliamentary. Have. Yes, we've, I know. We've made it. Yeah. And and likewise, uh, so are the friends of Banks Peninsula. Yeah. So and our understanding is they were very happy with both submissions. Yeah. yeah. So if things change, I, I felt we that, will be able that to. point was well received, <coughs> and the um, MPs who sat on the hearing, uh, they were well aware of the subject before I arrived. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very thank much you, for your you. submission. Thank much you. appreciated. <coughs> uh, next is um, Julie Sparks from Step Ahead. It's almost, it's, ready to go. Yes. it's almost trendy these days to say you have a mental health problem, especially when, amongst our politicians when they mess up. But mental health is what our trust is all about, supporting people who have mental health issues, and we've been doing this successfully in Christchurch for 37 years. Kia ora, I'm Julie Sparks from Step Ahead Trust. Step Ahead Trust is a rehabilitation service which offers a full programme of activities to people who have, are diagnosed with mild to moderate mental health conditions. Those in between people who are not sick enough to go to Hillmorton Hospital, but nevertheless are not well enough to function in the community. So who among you have heard of Step Ahead? Good, I'm surprised. We usually fly under the radar a bit. Sorry, I'm sorry I didn't we're... put my hand up. I you do? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> oh, it's better than I thought. Yeah. Um, but we're, we are actually very well known in the mental health sector. Our organisation is unique in New Zealand. There are no other trusts that just do activities like us. The amazing service we provide helps people who need a hand up out of depression, anxiety and other mild to moderate health issues. It stops them from sliding down into a worse state that needs greater intervention. 
We do this by giving our members something to do, somewhere to go, a place to learn new skills, socialise improve the, and improve their mental health. We provide our members with life skills in the sense that they truly belong in the community. You can see by our slides, our activities span everything that you can think of. Our members decide what they want to do and we make it happen for them. So I'm here today to talk to you about our rates remission. We've already put in a written submission and I'm just backing that up. And this year we advised that we could lose this, a $7,000 discount. This is $7,000 of extra activities we have been able to provide for 37 years uh, for, since we've been in operation. Yes, since 1984, and herein lies our problem. We are financially responsible, successful, careful with funding, and keep a rainy day fund. Over the years, we've managed to purchase two houses, one which only opened two years ago. We're not a rich trust. Our board members don't get paid a cent, and our staff are all on moderate pay. In fact, the amount we keep on hand is just over the amount to continue, we're allowed to keep continuing the rates rebate. It seems all very unfair. We feel like we're being penalised for being financially sound. Losing the 7,000k will not break us, but it will mean that we have 7,000 less in services to offer our members. Probably not much money to the Christchurch City Council, but to us, it's a, very, it's a lot. So it comes down to me to who gets the most value for this money. The most, we both spend our funding to benefit the Christchurch people. The Christchurch DHB, Ministry of Social Development and Rata Foundation, who are our funders, believe we are doing a pretty good job of doing what we do, and our members love us too. They tell us we change their lives. In 2020, we began an innovative new project where we help people with disabilities get online. We provide cell phones, tablets, Chromebooks and modems and then train them how to use their devices. Very few other organisations in New Zealand have been successful at getting people with disabilities online, but we are. And the MSD have backed us with extra funding to keep this innovative fund running. There are in ever-increasing numbers of people in New Zealand with mental illness, and Christchurch is a real hotspot, and it's happening at Step Ahead too. We've just had our two busiest months ever, and this is placing more strain on our funds. So we think taking away some of our valuable dollars can't be in the best interest of the people of Christchurch or the Christchurch City Council. So the question I would like you to consider is, who can make better use of those rates mission funds, the Christchurch City Council or Step Ahead Trust? and of course other trusts who own property just like us. We hope you choose the trusts. Please think carefully about this and we look forward to hearing your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is time for questions, but I, I just want to say that it makes a huge difference when people come along um, and make a personal um, representation as you have to back up your submission, you know, because oh, you can read it in writing. Mm. Um, and I know Step Ahead Trust very well, but I, um, that it was in my constituency when I was first elected. Oh, okay. And so I um, have visited there. I, I know the work that you do. But for you to come along and make it personal and relate it to the amount of money that we're talking about and the impact that it would have on your organisation, the people you serve, um, very powerful. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm pleased. I hope it'll make a difference to your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Celeste Donovan, New Brighton Road Action Group. I'm just being the button pusher. And go again. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so thanks everyone for your time. Um, I know that talking about roading isn't always the sexiest subject, so we try to make it as interesting but also as short as possible. So um, I take it everyone's read the submission. So we're here on behalf of Concern New Brighton residents to discuss the lack of allocated funding in the long-term plan for future repairs to the long, uh, New Brighton Road. As you'll be aware, the New Brighton, the East, sustained considerable damage during the earthquakes which has had a negative impact on our residents, our local businesses, and also community morale. This included damage to two of our key transport routes, which is Pages Road and New Brighton Road. While we're really grateful for all the incredible work that's been done by the council so far to repair the roads in the east, we're here today because we're disappointed the funding to complete the roads, um, the repairs to the ro roads in New New Brighton Road are absent from the draft long-term plan and we request that it be included. 
More specifically, we're requesting that the full repair and future proofing of New Brighton Road includes a two-way section, as well as completing repairs to the pathways and cycleways to pre-earthquake standards in the long-term plan. So to gauge public support, we conducted uh, a survey um, where we received over 500 submissions. We also received written submissions from residents, uh, associations, businesses, community groups, and individuals within the area. As you can see, the feedback we received showed overwhelming support for repair of the road. So over 92% of people supported repairs. And we also received strong feedback that people wanted to see reinstatement of the two lane system. Uh, so not only is there strong support for this within the community, but there's also a strong business case, we believe. Firstly, the New Brighton Road is an important transport linkage between three commercial and industrial cores. There's just over 25,000 people living in the east, and a large number of people rely on this road to travel every day to work and school in the commercial cores, which are hidden a little bit in the industrial area as well. For transport operators such as taxis and couriers, this route also saves time and mileage costs, which in turn reduce costs for our retailers and res residents. The other key issue, of course, is that this road provides an important evacuation route for residents in this area. Reinstatement of a two-lane system allows emergency access to North New Brighton, gives options to avoid congestion in an emergency if the key road's detour is blocked off, or if there's damage to the New Brighton Road and having evacuated in one of the tsunami alerts from off of Hawke Street, I know that there was considerable congestion getting across that bridge. Uh, thirdly, flooding. Further repairs are needed to future-proof vulnerable sections of, of the road, which we have sort of five key areas which are commonly prone to flooding. Um, although some of the issues, of course, are complex and require a longer-term longer solution, in the short term, some of the immediate flooding issues can be um, proved by investing in raising sections, including the footpaths and the cycleways. Um, as you can see in some of these photos, one of the main causes of flooding along the road is a result of high tides and water coming through the grates, um, which can be improved slightly by raising the road, finding a solution to stop the water flowing back into the pipes and maybe the diverting some of this water into the red zone. Lastly, there's been quite a bit of investment on this infrastructure already. The foundation to fully repair the road and paths are already in place. Um, and as you can see from the photos, we've got some ones already done on your Brighton Road and Anzac Drive. Uh, and then we've also got Anzac Drive and Loxley Terrace. But where we're at now is more investment is required to repair the roads, to fix the paths and curbs, and to remove some of the old driveways. What we're looking for is adequate funding in the long term plan to ensure. You can complete work to ensure this road, the cycle lanes and paths are back to pre-earthquake standards or better. Our residents and businesses appreciate the investment so far and we would appreciate your support. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, James. Um, thanks Celeste and Joe. Um, are you aware that money, you're aware that money is in the LTP for the new bridge at Pages Road? And that design doesn't incorporate New Brighton Road, right? Mm. Currently, are you aware of that? Uh, no, I haven't told anyone. Oops. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a, no, it's, it's, it's public, public information. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. Is it anyway, public information? It's in the it, it, it's, a it's fact. in the budget. That it is in the budget, mm. which is in the LTP for okay. Pages Road. Oh yes, but the design of the bridge hasn't been made public, has it? Oh. Anyway, anyway, so the, my, then my, <laughs> yeah. the answer is no then, obviously, but um, then the next question is, are you aware that the community board has had several briefings on exactly this matter and uh, has had a lot of discussion on it and doesn't support this idea? Well, I mean, I'm here with the members of the community board, but our, I mean, as a member of the Residents Association, if there's been discussions had, we certainly haven't received that information from the community board. So as you can see from the survey, if the community board's views are at odds with the residents' views, 
then there needs to be further conversations yeah, about it does. why those decisions have been sort of... Yeah. And do, last question is, yeah. do you know how much it would cost to... how much would have to put in the LTP for this? We've heard that there's been estimates, but I don't think it's been fully costed. However, because some investment's been made in the roading system already, part of what we're looking for is a kind of completion of the work that's been started. So we've got partial repairs to roads, which then end in, into damage. So people using that road have access to parts of the road, but then they hit flooding. So I think there needs to be sort of, I probably better communication with some of the residents about yeah. the views of the community board, but also maybe a discussion about why residents view the road as quite an important asset. Yeah, look, I, I think that there's, there's, there's still a lot of work to do in this mm. space because, um, you know, I mean, there's, 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 there's uh, you know, I mean, I, I used to live there, you know, mm. and I know um, the water used to come up from up, above, up below the ground, you know, so it's, it's a challenging area. So it's got, um, so whether the, the road is reinstated where it is or whether it is uh, redesigned, or whether it is um, re, re, whether traffic is redirected, it, there, there are solutions. But the solution, as you're saying, is not identified in our budget, and that is a conversation we need to have with the community before we put the money on the budget. So um, I think I'm, I'm taking away from this submission that there is um, considerable support for the connection and. Um, the repaired section to be reconnected to New Brighton, um, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's a reinstatement of New Brighton roads as is where is, um, because uh, I think that might create further challenges down the road, uh, well, down the road, literally, for um, communities in the future. So, but that's, that's my opinion, not uh, a council position. So um, I'm, I, I kind of want to say thank you very much for your submission. It is very good that you have um, uh, uh, surveyed your mm -hmm. community for their views, and uh, that bodes very well for a public engagement about what will happen next in terms of the traffic work in that area. So thank you very much. Cool, thanks very much thank for your time. Uh, St Teresa School. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Sarah Poulsen. I am a kayako at St Teresa School in Rikitin, and I am here, along with some of our ākonga, to support our pool, Whāranui Pool. Year after year, we bring little people to Whāranui Pool, Many of our immigrant families, this is their first pool experience, showering, rain and water play being the very closest that they've come to a pool. An example from one of our kaiko is Jessie, who was clinging to one of the teachers, legs wrapped around her waist, fear written all over her face. Perched beside the deliciously warm pool, gently splashing the water onto her arm and leg, slowly coaxing her, sitting her on the side of the pool, holding her tightly, gently bringing her feet to the bar, splashing them, drying her eyes, passing her tentatively into the arms of the swimming coach. This was the beginning of Jessie's swimming lessons at Whāranui as a five-year-old. This same little girl is now in year five, confidently swims up to a length of the learner pool, and we expect that she will be in the big pool at the end of the year. This story repeats itself year after year as we coax our little people into the pool. Our parents are not in a position to pay for private lessons. When you live in a garage or you're paying $400 of rent when your income is $526, you do the maths. If this was you, would you or could you be adding swimming lessons to your budget? The added cost of busing our children to a pool will result in one of two things for our school. We don't take them to lessons or we reduce the lessons by half. I mean, we know about tight budgets we also know about priorities. Jessie wouldn't be the confident little swimmer she is today with half of the lessons. The drowning statistics in New Zealand are a blight on our society. Our immigrant population all too often features in the statistics. As a school, we are doing our best so that our students don't become one of the statistics. We need an accessible pool and we need lessons that our family can afford. 
Nathan, another five-year-old terrified of the water, clung to Jen, who is the general manager of Faranui, who was filling in for a team member. He wouldn't put his feet on the floor. Nathan clung to Jen for almost the whole lesson. Jen was not phased. She let him cling to him while still managing to take the rest of the group. In the last five minutes of the lesson, Nathan let go and out on his feet onto the floor of the pool. He was so excited. The next day we went back, Jen, who wasn't supposed to be taking any more lessons, got into the pool each day for Nathan so he would feel confident and safe with her. After each lesson, he would come up running to the teacher saying, I touched the floor today and I didn't cry. Every teacher at Wharanui Pool makes our kids feel <coughs> safe and confident in the water. They don't push them into what they're not ready for. They are patient and kind to the children who are nervous and are scared. Our kids love the teachers and they love our pool. For a lot of our children, the 10 lessons a year we take them are the only opportunity that they get to swim. We have had many children who have struggled in the water. We had expressed to Jen that we wanted to get some of our struggling swimmers back into the pool for some more lessons. Last week, we got an email from the Doreen Brown Trust. They have funded 15 lessons for 24 children with caps and goggles included. This was actioned by the team at Faranui, and it is a true blessing for our tamariki. In addition, when we asked our Akonga what their feelings were about Faranui Pool, this was a selection of the comments. The coaches are nice and friendly. There are a variety of pools that suit every lesson and every level. The coaches really get to know you personally. And they want us to improve each and every time. It has a family atmosphere. It's so great we don't have to bus. It's super close to our school and it's safe. We implore you, our elected councillors, to please retain Wharanui Pool. It is our taonga. Our tamariki are far too precious to be another statistic and we want them to be confident, competent swimmers, which we know the whānau at Wharanui Pool provide abundantly. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, and thank you very much for your submission. It's joined um, by a number of others that we've received. Um, mm. We've seen the signs before, so thank you to all the young people who came along to provide support for your submission mm. today. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, Peter Scholes. Uh, Peter's talking to us about the uh, DC policy. Kia ora and welcome. Oh, thank you. I've just changed my glasses so I can see. Thank you. Um, so this is my oral submission, was it to the draft development contribution? To go with my written one. The earth is, is rumbling. The people are grumbling. The UAGC depresses the best. The West pays for the rest. The costs come here. The benefits go there. The rugby is not tonight. The shops are stacked with sales tonight. The land is full of parking lots. The bus is full of rot. The people are cold and the gold is sold. That's my um, oral submission. Thank you. I uh, like it when people put um uh, a, a sort of an artistic frame to their oh, uh, to their submission because you've summed up the issues that you've raised in your submission uh, very well. Has anyone got any questions? Oh. 
I think yeah. I think councillors would really appreciate it if you would give us a copy. Are you able to email it through? Uh, no, sorry, I don't do email. You don't do email? <laughs> would you be able to leave a copy? Yeah, or, a or we, we could photocopy copy. it if you would like to take yes. the original home with you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we'll organise that. Right? that. Thank you thank, very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, the next submission is um, Chris Doodney, who's here on the climate change strategy. Thank goodness your son told us how to pronounce your name properly before you arrived. It was perfect today. <laughs> you have my submission on the climate draft climate change strategy before you, and I just have a few notes. Um, firstly, it's it is critical that the city has a strategy that obtains most of its desired results in the near term, that is, between 2021 and 2030. Secondly, critical to the issue of climate change is the complete cessation of fossil fuels use as energy sources. This means nationally much more solar generation, build much more wind generation and use the hydro lakes as batteries. We can do this now, we just need to decide to do it. And the city has an enormous role to play in the implementation of local solar generation. Thirdly, we must pursue immediate actions, for example, A, attack transport issues, get more EV buses, support the expansion of EV charger network throughout the city, use EVs for all city vehicles, including rubbish trucks, which you can buy now. Disincentivise fossil, fossil fuel use and incentivise electrical power use. Actions can be taken starting now. The council needs to take leadership. Support that is subsidised green industry, for instance, wind turbine manufacturing and servicing in the city, and ensure funding is available through the LTP or otherwise from 2021 onwards. It's look at it as investment rather than rather than loss. And finally, ignore the so-called clean gas and hydrogen lobbyists, dreamers or fossil fuel apologists with no relevance to the current emergency. Are there any questions? Right, thank you. Um, questions from councillors? Nope. Pretty comprehensive. Submission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, One Schools Network, Silas Jung. Uh, hopefully you've uh, received the supplementary paper that was uh, sent in uh, earlier. Kia koutou. Ko auraki te maunga. Ko wai makarere te awa. No o te tahi a hau. Ko zang tuku ingoa whānau. Ko Salas to Kuingoa. No, 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 Madam Mayor, Councillors, thank you for providing the opportunity to make an oral submission. My name is Silas Jung. I am the head student for Rickerton High School, and this is Emily McGifford, head student for Avonside High School. Today we are representing the One Schools Network and making a submission to the draft long term plan. One Schools Network is an organisation made up of the head students from secondary schools across Otatahi Christchurch and the wider Christchurch area. We are the student leaders from within the 35 secondary schools in the region, which approximates to 30,000 secondary school students. We regularly meet at alternating schools to share ideas and discuss best practices in student leadership and kōrero with like-minded student leaders. The climate crisis is an issue that impacts everyone, but in particular, our future. As a collective of secondary school students, we believe that action must be taken to address both the impact and the root cause of climate change. We acknowledge the actions taken by the Council to address the climate crisis. However, we believe there is still more to be done. Council's declaration of a climate emergency in 2019 which was a major step forward. However, it must now be backed by comprehensive action. Council's principles for responding to climate change, as outlined in the draft climate change strategy 2021, to act boldly, think long term and be evidence based, mark a step in the right direction. Secondary school students make use of a wide variety of council public services, so shortening library hour open hours may impact students. Public libraries are a vital public service. 
for secondary school students. They're a place for study, a place to engage with other students and stay connected with the community. They are a space that allows for secondary school students to take part in democracy, a place for student league organisations to meet. In fact, this submission was written in a public library. A reduction in hours may also lead to a loss of safe areas for students to study at night. Many students do not have stable home lives or access to internet. Public libraries provide a space that benefits students who may need it. As secondary school students, we want fast, sustainable, and safe options to travel to school and throughout Otatahi Christchurch. Transport to school is a major issue for us and we ask the council to put a stronger focus on connecting major transport routes to schools. One Schools Network supports proposals to continue bus lane priority, intersection improvements and other public transport infrastructure upgrades. Many secondary school students use the bus network to commute to and from school. Further funding for public transport infrastructure could increase could increase ridership amongst students by reducing travel times and increasing comfort. I myself took the bus from school to this meeting using the Rickerton Road bus priority lane and so did Emily. Using the Rickerton Road bus priority lane greatly reduced my travel time, although I was still late. Continued efforts to build a more integrated and safer cycleway network could encourage more secondary school students to cycle to school. A cycleway network is being built near my school on what had been a dangerous route. I used to cycle using this route, and when the cycleway is completed, it will once again be a more attractive option. As head students and senior student leaders, we have a position where our voices can be heard. Yet it is not just our voices that are needed. The majority of secondary school students are unaware of how local governments make decisions that affect the city, despite the impact they have on students and school communities. Council should, be Council should ensure that there is adequate outreach to youth, as well as resources within school, to ensure young people can positively engage with local government as a whole. This will enable students to have the knowledge and the platforms to voice their opinion and make informed decisions. Namihi Nui, I'm, we are now open to questions. Kia ora and thank you. And uh, I just wanted to ask one quick question, and I'll let Mike ask a question. Um, and that is, is that have you as a group ever made a submission to um, a council plan before? Not before. This is our so first time. So thank you very much for doing so. Um, uh, we met um, at the school strike for mm. climate, um, and uh, and I'm so thrilled that you took this opportunity. So thank you, Mike. Thanks for your submission. 1.1 says that you support the improvement in uh, biodiversity outcomes mm. um, through the Biodiversity Fund. Mm. There's actually a proposal from Council to cut that fund to 190. Do you support that cut or would you actually like it to see it currently sits at 200,000 or increase? Well, uh, reading the plan we were unaware that it was $200,000, um, so that wasn't provided in the context of it. So if it was a cut, then we wouldn't support it. Thank you. So you'd like it reinstated to yes. the amount yes. it was before. Thank you. All right. Look, thank you both very much for coming in and for um, making your debut submission. <laughs> I hope this is the first um, of many times that we'll see you and your um, successors uh, uh, in that role um, here before the council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan Bidwell. everyone. Um, my name is Susan Bidwell and I am also presenting about the Thoranoi pool against its closure from a completely different perspective from the young children that you heard. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about, not going to start by talking about the location because I believe a lot of people have already mentioned what a wonderful location it is in. Um, however, my other points are connected to the location. Um, and that is the style of the pool. It provides a facility that is different in nature from other pools. Not only is it accessible, but it is not intimidating. And as a senior woman, and speaking on behalf of a large group of people in my age group who swim there, it is a place where we feel comfortable swimming, safe and non-intimidated. We do not want a high, um, a high impact pool where people do advanced training. 
Um, and Wharanui has a devoted clientele who love it precisely for what it is, plain and simple, a basic lane and learner's pool that keen swimmers like myself appreciate and where we feel welcome. As far as people like me are concerned, and this is quite a large cohort of people, it will be Wharanui or nothing, as there is no way that I and others will feel comfortable or even be able to get to a large new high performance pool in the city. My next point also relates to that, the innumerable mental and physical health benefits that we get from swimming. When I was in my early 40s, I was on fast track to becoming what my daughter called a respiratory cripple, and she took me down to Foranui and said, get in the pool, Mum, I've bought you a swimsuit, and get swimming. I was on inhalers and medicines, and really, I could have been having a life of respiratory infections, and since then, I have never, ever had any problems whatsoever. I have swum for close on 30 years there and had the most immense benefits. And of course, these are also mental health benefits as well. Um, I have never looked back, and with an ageing population, it is just so important that we remain fit and healthy for our own sake and also for the sake of society. There is already enough call on our health budget. It is no accident that people who are regular swimmers keep going into their late 80s and even into their 90s. And my last point ties all these together. The location and nature of the pool and the physical benefits that we get from the exercise bring immense social benefits. We have a strong community spirit links the swimmers and the staff there who look out for one another. For example, there was Eva who could no longer walk to the pool and people picked her up and brought there. We had Theo who swam into his 90s and for whom people cleared lane two because he had a, a very strange way of swimming. And my, <laughs> and my dear friend June who was about to turn 88 and still swimming 34 lengths twice a week and driving herself there. I have been swimming at Wharanui for close on 30 years. I have made very dear friends who I would never otherwise have met. We have shared joys and sorrows and special occasions, and they have been a key part of my life for all this time. Wharanui's special character makes it an invaluable part of the community. A large, high-performance complex in the city simply cannot replace it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much um, for your presentation today. Um, you, are, you have joined a large number of people. I know I have. have submitted as well. So thank you very much for your perspective. Uh, Jeanette Quinn. I was under the misapprehension that it was only going to be about three people. Good God. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I think I'd better tell you you're being live streamed as well. So. Um, you're on the internet. Oh, that makes it ten times worse. <laughs> Sorry. But look, just, just relax. It's okay. I will Everyone keep my head, is, is keep cool, my head calm down. Collected. Yeah. Cool, calm. Excuse me, where's the G and T? <laughs> um, okay, you're on about um, the game plan. The game plan is never going to be 100% right because... It doesn't matter what you do, there's going to be people that are going to be affected yeah. one way or the other. And if you get it right, I don't know what world you're on. Mm -hmm. um, now, being on a pension, one exists and doesn't actually live with a lot of extras that working people can have. Um, if one owns your own house, you've got your maintenance plus your normal full price on power, phone, insurance, rates and all that sort of stuff. If you've got a car, you've got again the um, registration, the insurance, the maintenance on the car where mine is at the moment getting done. Um, and I would like to challenge any councillor to have a go at living on a lower wage for about three months without access to a credit card or any credit loans from any of the families. Um, changing to the existing new targeted rates. Um, I've already stated in my submission, my opposition to rate pays forking out for expensive projects like the cathedral. Um, how much has already been wasted on legal fees, surveys, etc. And a lot of other establishments, churches, etc. have done their own fundraising and they have got on with their own rebuilding. Now, you're talking about excess water rate. In 1994, when I moved to Canterbury, there was talk about the council 
going to install individual meters at each residence or business. Now it happened. Cross lease sections where who knows who uses what, um, that can be a heck of a problem. There's one lady was telling me there are six units on a property that she is at. They have one meter for the whole of the six units. How the hell do you work out who's using excess water? And if anybody starts up a meth lab, I understand that meth labs take a hell of a lot of water. How would you then turn around and work out who's the excess user under those circumstances? Um, there's also talk about maybe a super city council like they created up in Auckland. If that happened here, how is the council going to justify residents paying XX water rates while you've got business, dare I mention the bottling plant out the road, who, yes, I know legally they have the right, but morally, do they have the right to take as much as they like when residents might have to end up by paying extra? Um, and as regards to the water, yes, we do need clean, unadulterated water for drinking and for people with certain medical conditions. I understand that if people have got their own home dialysis, they need pretty pure water. Um, has there ever been a look at, with the increases of diseases and illnesses, like cancer, ADS and the like, where scientists have actually proved or disproved that it might be chemicals that are being added to the water that could be affecting us all. And mm -hmm. if there are scientists doing it, are they doing the research that is not being funded by a chemical company that wants to promote their products? For the rubbish uh, recycling and all the rest of it, good on you, thump the hell out of the ones who are actually putting all the garbage into the recycling bins and the likes. Yes, they need to be really done. Um, and one question I have got, if you put glass containers, bottles, jars, into your yellow bin, when it gets tipped into the truck, you hear that crunch, crunch, crunch as everything gets compacted down, does that have an ultimate effect on everything that has gone into the rubbish that day that it's all contaminated with broken bits of glass and would have to then go to the general rubbish dump. Mm. Um, yeah. And for the bus exchange, please keep the lounges at Rickerton Road open um, for security reasons, for older people. I'm, yes, I am one of the older ones, but there are older ones who are very infirmed that have difficulty. There is one of the security ladies there. She is absolutely marvellous. She will make sure that anybody who's got issues of any sort, whether they're young kids or whether they've got their own mobility, she will get them to their buses. She will even get some of them onto their buses and seat it. If we lose those security people, we're going to be in strife because we're going to get those idiots that we were causing problems here before and there's no security at night if you go to the pictures come out well if any of your kids go to the pictures late and come out on the street would you be happy in the middle of winter no shelter no nothing i'm, I'm going to have to wind it up there because you've come to the end of your time but but thank you so much for your um submission we we, we have what you submitted in writing, but you've made it very personal um, to you, and I, it's much appreciated. Thank you. I have got one other question to ask. One other question. Okay. Right. The stadium that is being built, mm -hmm. when and if there is a World Cup competition back in New Zealand again, is the seating capacity going to be sufficient for the international rugby boards who cream the money off everything for them to let some of the high profile matches be played here, or are they going to say, sorry, you haven't got enough seats to put bums on, we'll send it to Auckland, Wellington or Dunedin? Well, that, that, that is a question yet to be answered, so um, we will find out in due course. <laughs> right, because that one that is one thing. I hate to see the money going offshore because <laughs> there's not going to be enough seats here. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, Aramia Merito 
or to Tahi? Ma, do you? Sorry. Merito, is it? Merito. <laughs> or to Tahi Sports <laughs> Association. My apologies. Thank you, Paul. Uh, ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau ti hei mauri ora. Tēnei au e mihi atu ki a rātou, ko a wehe atu i te pō, ki o tātou nei tūpuna i whakatūwhiratia mai te huarahi mō a mātou karapu o ōtau tahi, ko hōhua tū te ngaihe, ko nau huata, ko Montero Daniels, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Ki a tātou te hunga ora, tēnā rā koutou, ki a koe te rangatira o tātou nei whare, Me te whanaunga e James, tēnā kōrua. Ko Jody Brown tōku ingoa, he uru tēnei o rongo whakāta. Ko au te tiamana o Ōtautahi Rugby Club. I raro i te maru o Ōtautahi Sports Association. Nō reira tēnā rā koutou katoa. Tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ko Arumi Meri tō tōku ingoa, he uru tēnei o ngā tiawa me ngā puhi oku iwi. Ko au te tiamana o Ōtautahi Sports Association. Tēnā rā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you for having us speak to you all today. We're here to support our submission to the draft LPT document, in particular, page 62, Parks and Foreshore, i.e. Lancaster Park. Ko uh, Mato, who are we? Ōtautahi Sports Association was first registered as an incorporated society charitable trust in 1988. However, we have been in existence as a rugby club since 1969, derived from the highly successful Māori Trade Training Scheme at Rehua Marae, Te Kaihanga, Te Aranga and Roseneath Hostel during the periods of the late 1950s to the 1980s. We have our own privately owned club room situated in the heart of Phillipstown on Chewham Street and have operated our whānau activities there since the late 1980s. Our whare on Chewham Street is now used <coughs> by multiple groups every week day and available for whānau and club activities in the weekends. We no longer hold a liquor licence by choice and still we manage to generate income to keep our doors open for community activities as well as our own. We want to thank the Christchurch City Council for your contribution to our club as it has allowed us to give back to our many volunteers and we now contract a paid Hauora coordinator. Ōtautahi Sports Association supports the increase of budget to the Phase 1 redevelopment of Lancaster Park so local sports recreation for whānau can once again commence in the area. Ōtautahi Sports Association currently has a membership of approximately 700 this number includes volunteers and members across all of our clothes, which include rugby, netball, touch, softball, basketball, golden oldies, and the Otate Sports Association executive. Ōtautahi Rugby Football Club's home grounds are currently located at Bower Park in Rafati Ki Ōtautahi. Since the earthquakes, Bower Park has had extensive damage to the fields, changing rooms, toilets and surrounding area, most of which is red zone. We have been working alongside the Canterbury Rugby Football Union for the past three years to find suitable grounds where we can continue to grow our membership and provide our services to our community. The CRFU put forward the request for usage of Lancaster Park on behalf of Ōtautahi Rugby due to our location and club needs. All of our codes of Ōtautahi Sports have seen a dramatic increase in membership we have also seen a huge increase in participation with whānau seeking out hauora, kotahitanga and whakawhanaungatanga within their community. We currently have funding contracts with Te Pūtahitanga and Te Punikōkiri as well as the Ministry of Education to deliver whānau hauora programmes and our longest standing funder to date is the Rata Foundation who fund our club coordinator who we honestly couldn't do without. Our initiatives will positively impact our whānau in a range of ways, in, in a range of ways through our connection with Te Ao Māori, through Waiata, Te Reo, Toe Māori and our Matariki events. We know that the connection to a sports club is more than physical health and can improve holistic development in mental health. In closing, Ōtautahi Sports were founded by our tipuna with the vision that our sporting codes would be based at the same whenua that Ōtautahi sports would also be sustainable for their children and generations to follow.
I am proud to say that my children are fourth generation ototahi and that we support the increased budget of the Lancaster Park redevelopment plan. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ra koutou katoa. Kia ora. Um, Tim. Um, has the rugby union um, come back to you with regards to the, um, what the council said with regards to the Lancaster Park and being a home ground for you guys? Rugby Union come back, no, but we had been a multiple hui yep. uh, with the other partners, um, including the, with the council and um, the Canterbury Rugby Football Union. We still there's still a lot of ifs and what what next. Mm. Um, so yeah, but we are still sitting at the table. Great, thank you. Yep, uh, James. Uh, tēnā kōrua, uh, kei te tangi ahau, mō te uh, o tō uh, kaupapa uh, ka pai tō mahi uh, ka mau te wehi kia ora. kia ora kia ora thank you so thank you very much for your submission today it's very helpful thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, Fiona Wicks from Heritage New Zealand Kia ora, welcome. Kia ora. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Fiona Wikes, toku ingoa, uh, ko Ote, kai whakataira a uh, Takiwa, Canterbury West Coast. For Heritage New Zealand, Paul Hero Taonga, I am the area manager for Canterbury West Coast. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this hearing today. Um, as you probably <coughs> all know, Heritage New Zealand Pōhere Tonga is an autonomous Crown entity with statutory responsibility under the Heritage New Zealand Pōhere Tonga Act 2014 for the identification, protection, preservation and conservation of New Zealand's historic and cultural heritage, and heritage is obviously the focus of this submission. Um, firstly, we acknowledge the challenge of preparing the LTP following the financial impacts of both the earthquakes and the COVID-19 pandemic. And in general, we support the proposed budgets that contribute to heritage protection throughout the plan and recognise that $57 million of total proposed spending is allocated for heritage projects. <coughs> our heritage at Aonga defines us. It is a fundamental part of the fabric of our community and contributes to people's personal sense of belonging and identity and anchors people to their communities and their city. We support the Council's acknowledgement that the buildings, places and stories of Christchurch and its people are part of the city's identity. Um, Heritage New Zealand Pohere Tanga supports the significant repair projects involving heritage buildings that will be undertaken in the first three years of the new plan, in particular the Arts Centre Te Mata Tiki Toi Ora, ongoing repairs, Robert McDougall Art Gallery strengthening and weather tightness, former municipal chambers repair and refurbishment, Canterbury Provincial Council buildings and Christchurch Cathedral. All of these buildings are listed category one with us. There are three targeted rates proposed to support heritage and we consider this may provide a clearer picture of the specific projects that ratepayers contribute to and therefore could result in a greater feeling of ownership towards these projects. The three targeted rates relating to heritage are to fund the $10 million grant for the restoration of the cathedral, um, to fund a $5.5 million grant over three years to the Arts Centre of Christchurch and to fund works for the Canterbury Provincial Council buildings, the former municipal chambers and the Robert McDougall Art Gallery. We support these initiatives as they help deliver the funding already pledged to the Cathedral to assist with the ongoing functioning of the Arts Centre, which has been badly affected, first by the Canterbury earthquakes and then by COVID-19, and to start repairs on key heritage buildings for Christchurch, which are owned and or managed by Council and have been deteriorating. Christchurch Cathedral is a very significant landmark in the city, is closely linked to the development of Christchurch as a city following the arrival of Europeans. It is considered a key part of the wider area of Gothic revival architecture, which includes the Arts Centre, the Museum, Christ College and the Canterbury Provincial Council buildings. The building gives its name to a major feature of Cathedral Square and its restoration is seen as a key part of the city's identity by many members of the Christchurch community. The Cathedral project is intended to be inclusive of the wider community whilst ensuring the building continues to be an active church, which is, of course, a key element of its history and significance. In relation to the Arts Centre, Te Matatiki Toi Ora, the targeted rate will assist the Arts Centre in continuing its ongoing repair and restoration work. It will ensure that the progress on these buildings can continue and the area can once more 
be a drawcard for both locals and visitors to Christchurch. It will enable it to fulfil its role as a viable and active part of the community. <clears throat> and the Canterbury Provincial Council buildings um, have been protected by legal statutes since 1928, and this was the first time that the New Zealand Government passed legislation to protect an historic building, which gives you some idea of their importance. Um, they are the only purpose-built Provincial Council buildings still extant in New Zealand. Um, and they are nationally important complex. We support all efforts to restore them and provide for appropriate uses within the buildings. The targeted rates will also support the repair and refurbishment to the former municipal chambers, which is nationally significant as the first purpose-built premises for the use of the City Council. Um, plus, it's a prominent landmark in Christchurch on the banks of the river, as well as being striking for being designed in the Queen Anne style and therefore differing from all the Gothic revival buildings of other major public buildings at the time. We support the innovative and practical approach of um, Christchurch City Council to the restoration and adaptive reuse of this building. Um, I will skip on quickly because I see I'm running out of time. Um, Robert McDougall will be really good. It will be good to enable finding continued and more viable use for the building in the future because, um, again, it's highly significant. We do note that in the LTP there is no provision for ongoing heritage incentive grants but we do see there is a proposal to commit approximately 200,000 to assist with the protection and recognition of intangible heritage and the Heritage Festival. So while this will impact on a small number of property owners, we are hopeful that the Intangible Heritage Programme can and will have a positive impact on the wider recognition and appreciation for heritage and what that means to everyone today. Heritage New Zealand Pohere Taonga supports the proposed climate change response and in particular working with Naitahu and Papatipu Runanga businesses, organisations and the community to develop and action the Ototahi Christchurch Climate Change Strategy and the adaptation planning for those impacted by sea level rise, the effects of rising groundwater and flooding issues. All these matters can, be, can significantly affect heritage sites. We would support additional incentives that could promote the protection and conservation of heritage. We support incentivising the retention and continued use, including adaptive reuse of heritage, through various mechanisms that are available to Council. Some may need to be addressed through the LTP due to financial implications such as rates relief, free or fixed price consenting or fast track consenting or similar approach. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Kia ora. Thank you very much for an extensive submission and, and thank you very much. Barreling through it as fast as possible. I know, but that's great. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Kia ora. Are you Mark Baskin? No. No. Okay. Are you James Harris? I'm Francis Johnson. You um, are? Oh, Francis Johnson, who I thought was a woman. Right, there you go. <laughs> Francis, <laughs> welcome. Could, would you like to come forward? Yeah, we've, we've got some others. Who, we're running slightly ahead of schedule, so um, a number of people haven't arrived yet, and they're still on their way in, I suspect. So if you'd like to take um, the chair at the end of the table and... Um, Present your submission. Thank you. Do apologise. It is spelt correctly for, for a bloke. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for the chance to speak here today. Um, I have a background in mathematics, engineering, politics and economics. I think the principles in the strategy document are great, but, and many of its recommendations are heading in the right direction, but they don't go nearly far enough. Um, first of all, net zero just isn't enough. Um, to take an example, the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere, say, 10 years ago, is heating the earth now and is causing a, a lot of suffering around the world, especially to, to, the, to, the, to the most vulnerable people. Um, and so planting trees to, must be seen as a way of undoing that harm that we have already done, not as a way of giving us a licence to have more emissions um, when those emissions will, will stay in the, in the atmosphere for centuries. So this means we have to stop burning fossil fuels altogether, and we have to do that quickly. So that's a really radical change uh, that I don't see, and I don't see that in the, in the plan. That means we have to get used to using a lot less energy. But if the transition is well planned, then we needn't be worse off for that. Um, it, regarding cars, um, we need to take responsibility for the emissions we cause, not just those um, that are emitted within our city. So that um, means that um, EVs aren't a magic bullet because their manufacture um, causes emissions and environmental problems. 
So we have to plan for a future with many fewer cars. And the council spending should reflect this. So what I ask the council to do here is to have a vision of, of a city with way, way fewer cars, and that therefore the bulk of the transport spending should be aligned with that future. The, the, the future is, that isn't the future. The future is active public transport and a city um, that's arranged so that a lot less travel is needed. Um, now, regarding the council-owned um, companies, um, they're doing a lot to decarbonise their own operations, but there's a much bigger problem, which is the industries that they enable. The council should not be enabling high emissions industries. So, therefore, the council should set a date after which it will not allow coal to be exported through the port of Littleton. And that date, I think, should be as soon as possible in the next small number of years. Coal kills, and I think it's immoral that the council is enabling that industry to continue. Christchurch Airport is doing a lot to reduce its own emissions. Um, however, again, the industry it supports is a huge issue. Zero emissions aircraft don't exist yet, and they may never exist. Um, but we need to reduce our emissions now. Therefore, the council must reduce the number of flights that it allows through Christchurch Airport. Um, in fact, the opposite seems to be happening. The, the airport has a 2040 plan for, um, for airport expansion, which is going exactly in the opposite direction to the direction that the climate emergency that you have declared um, requires. Likewise, um, uh, the council should um, cancel all plans for the proposed airport at Terrace. And air travel should be allowed to increase, increase again only if there's proven sustainable aircraft technology. And if such technology uses biofuels, then it must not jeopardise food production by competing for land. Eating is more important than flying. The climate strategy must have a plan to ensure that it can compel council-owned properties to act in the public good, not to enable high emissions industries. So please treat this as an emergency like COVID. The Council must envision radically different ways of living. We can't afford to wait for technological solutions. They may come too late or never. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And um, you've come to the end of the presentation, so um, it's probably a good time for us to take a, a short recess. And uh, thank you very much for your submission today. OK, thank, thank you. you. If we come back here at 2.30, mm -hmm. then hopefully, yeah. hopefully That's good. people will be here. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, so we'll um, reconvene the meeting. Thank you, um, everybody, for, for waiting. Um, our next submitter is um, Mark Baskand. Mark, if I could um, invite you to the table, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, apologies for the, the odd spelling mistakes in, that. in my submission. It was a late night effort, uh, just trying to get the deadline. So apologies for that. Just a bit louder. Um, so I'll just highlight some main points. 1.1 um, with the game plan, um, really my first point relates to generating income, more direct income from visitors um, and tourists into Christchurch. So the 2021-22 financial year, um, the rates projected 57% income um, from rates and 13% from fees, charges and operational subsidies. Um, I often hear that an event will bring X amount of money into uh, the Christchurch, um, the local economy, but um, often wonder how much the council and ratepayers um, actually direct, directly benefit from that. Um, obviously there's um, increased wages to people in those industries and maybe some revenue back from council assets. Um, is therefore when there's a large event a lot of people in, in town there will be increased um, use of water sewage and, and general wear and tear on properties and amenities. Um, GST gets carved off and I just do wonder if there was um, any thought or future planning for um, something like a, a room night charge through the hotels for people that would stay here. Um, I, I didn't see that in the plan, but um, I'm just putting that forward. I've seen it in other you know, countries and places and a way to sort of harness the money into, um, into the, the council. And when there's the CBD stadium to go ahead and you've got the conference centre, other tourist attractions and infrastructure, um, that would help pay for that and, and draw back those costs. Um, obviously, there's economic... You know, tax and marketing factors at play there, uh, quite a lot with um, demand and attracting people here, um, but it would capture some, some sort of justified revenue stream um, for the council and ratepayers. Uh, time's going fast, so I'll quickly uh, go through to the next part with the uh, transport infrastructure 1.5. Um, two big things. Please push for the increase in um, bus frequency. It's a major factor for myself and also um, any concessions that could be done. Um, I've, def I mean, I've lived in London, Melbourne, lots of other places. I'd happily pay weekly annually for public transport. Um, I'm trying to mix that up with biking and busing. It just doesn't quite work. I'd love to make it work, pay that forward. Um, you can get, what is it, 124 for urban transport. I'd happily pay 500 or more, 15 a week. And um, so, yeah, just please push that. That's the, the quick thing. And lastly, for the facilities, totally in support of Furnary Pool remaining open. Um, I think my sort of analogy through with the libraries, every library has their own um, suburban branch, which is highly influential, um, great at the core activities, but also functioning as community hubs for other activities that are happening too. So it's up and running, it's value for the ratepayers at the moment. I just wouldn't dismiss that um, straight away. And um, the same token, you should, the, the central metro sports facility should be good, but um, surely there's hand-in-hand -hand opportunities. Great, thank you very much. You. That neatly brings us to the end of the um, three minutes, but quite a bit of variety in the submission yeah. there. Thanks very much indeed for the submission points and the written submission that we've got in front of us as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so next we've got um, Sonia, um, representing the Christchurch Fluoride Free New Zealand Action Group. Sonia, um, you've got five minutes to present to us this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, allowing me to come and speak to you all today. Uh, I'd like to start by asking um, who here knows where the fluoride actually comes from? Anyone? All right, so this is an opportunity for you to present your views to us okay, rather than a more right. interactive session. Okay, thank apologies. you. Thank you. So I'd like to enlighten you where it comes from. Uh, fluoride is a byproduct, a poisonous, toxic byproduct of nitrate phosphate producing factories, of which we do have one here in Christchurch. 
uh, when the when they're cooking up the nitrates, uh, the uh, toxic byproduct is fluoride. So they have to clean out the chimneys and scrape out the chimneys. Now, fluoride is a very expensive product to dump, and it is illegal to dispose of it into the air, uh, rivers, lakes, and oceans. So it's also classified um, in the same category as arsenic and lead. Excuse me, I feel very nervous. <laughs> That's no problem. Thank you. So, so it is classified in the same category as arsenic and lead. So secondly, I would like to let you know how fluoride works. It does not work by swallowing it. It only works when you apply it topically to the, the teeth, dentally, OK? So it doesn't work by swallowing. Um, so if we allow fluoride to be added to the water supply, it's not only the human population that are going to be affected, it is the bird life, um, the, the ocean life, the whales, the dolphins, our pets, uh, and everything where the water goes out into the ocean. So the whales, the dolphins, as I said before, and, you know, we, we really do um, try to present ourselves worldwide as being New Zealand green and safe and pure. So 98% of Western European countries have banned fluoride being added to their natural water supplies, and more countries around the world are in the process of banning this toxic substance. Uh, Fluoride is also proven when added to populations water supplies to lower the IQ of humans and it's a neurotoxin to humans. Uh, babies on a formula where you would use water, it has been proven that they would receive up to 250 times the limit that would be added into our water because of their size, um, partly, and you know, there's a lot of water that they drank in the formula, with the formula. So we believe that you do have an obligation to the people of Christchurch and Canterbury, um, as you are paid by us uh, and elected by us, um, to make sure that you are scientifically abridged and you do study the um, implica health implications of fluoride in the public water supply as it being a chemical byproduct of an industry that already does pollute our waterways terribly, and I don't think there's any denying that. Uh, it will also cause, it would also cause, cause more health issues for our already overstretched DHB. Um, so what other sensible choices can we make? Uh, there is uh, a very good example in Scotland. They have what is called a child smile program. Now what this involves is dental nurses, they, I think it's dental nurses or people um, skilled in that kind of area. They go into uh, schools from the age uh, where from nursery schools right up to, I don't know, probably about five, eight or ten, and they have um, supervised toothbrushing um, every day at school, uh, and they teach children about um, dental health care. Um, so that would be an option, and that has been proven to have saved Scotland millions and millions of dollars, rather than adding the, the fluoride to their water supply. Uh, every child gets a dental pack a few times before they reach the age of about eight, where they get toothpaste uh, and other things in there. And they are also offered healthy snacks and drinks, which are free daily at their schools. Uh, Scottish children used to have worse dental uh, hygiene, well, hygiene and teeth than Kiwi kids, but today, um, they actually have less dental decay, they have less fillings, and there is a reduced number of children needing general anaesthetic dental surgeries because of this Child Smile program. Now that has brought us to the end of the five minutes allocated, unfortunately. If I could just say one more thing. Yep. Um, I would ask that the council would undertake a survey of the people of Christchurch and Canterbury to find out what they want 
um, in this aspect. And also, my last point is that if you invited me over to your place for brunch, and there was a crap of water on the table, and just before, when we sat down, I said, oh, look, do you mind if I pop these fluoride tablets in the water and then we can all pour it? Because I think it's, you know, safe for us to drink. Well, how would you feel if I did that in your home? I don't think anybody would be very pleased at all, and I think that you would not drink that water. So therefore, I end my submission. I do thank you very much. Apologies again for the nervousness, um, but if you would really consider this issue, that would be we, we would be very grateful. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and um, talk with us this afternoon. You're thank welcome. you. Welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. All right. So our next submitter. Um, is Carl Hunter. Is Carl here? Carrie. Uh, oh, Carrie, sorry. I've got hand, a handwritten message in front of me um, that um, I'm obviously not reading as I was intended, so that's fine. Um, my um, apologies. So, Carrie Hunter, thank you um, for joining us. Welcome. Um, and you've got three minutes to present to us this afternoon. Thank you. Tēnā koutou. Um, I'm glad you've declared a, declared a climate emergency and begun on a climate strategy, and thanks for your ears. Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, the strategy has good principles, many good activities, but it's too small in scale for the reality of the climate and biodiversity emergency. Please develop a strategy that goes much further to envisage how everyone's needs can be met in a zero emissions, sustainable, regenerative and resilient future Christchurch and develop a plan for how to get there from here as quickly as possible despite the uncertainties. This means a major reorientation of how we approach things. Incremental changes, while continuing largely with business as usual, won't get us there. Sustainable zero emissions means not burning fossil fuels. Offsetting is unreliable and unsustainable. It also means not relying on emissions produced outside our district. The strategy needs to allow for uncertainty and cover the range of possible climate impacts, including less likely but more severe ones. And everything the Council is responsible for should align with this vision. Since transport makes for a large part of Christchurch emissions, it makes sense to set the city up for much reduced travel and freight and implement safe, pleasant cycle lanes and active transport routes everywhere quickly. Um, and it makes sense to radically reduce the large funding that is put into roads for mass private cars. Maintaining previous standards is not a priority and expansions to reduce congestions impede the climate response. Aligning with a climate mitigation strategy means not enabling high emissions activities via our council-owned companies. For instance, there's no place in the climate emergency for another airport at Taras or for high flows of air traffic through Christchurch Airport. There's a case for putting a deadline very soon on the export of coal via our port and the use of our ports to support bottom trawling. A resilient city would be one that is more self-reliant, less dependent on imports, especially as the climate crisis may disrupt international supply lines. Mitigation and ad adaptation will require changing work patterns and housing needs. It would be good to see the Council lead Christchurch as fast as possible towards compact mix mixed use, medium density housing, for instance up to three storeys, businesses on the ground floor, integrated with green space, clustered around rapid transport nodes and served by active transport routes, not dominated by cars. Housing that will be re really affordable for the people who will need it, developed with low emissions and low waste construction methods. A long view would also consider wastewater treatment in the face of sea level rise sooner rather than later. The Council should be prepared to develop publicly owned housing that's consistent with its urban design strategy in cases where the private sector will not do so sufficiently or quickly enough. Lastly, it's a big task. In order to support the major changes and resources needed, people need to understand the scale of the emergency and why we can't live, keep living in the manner to which we've become accustomed. Appendix A shows the direct physical effects, the likely direct physical effects of climate change well. 
public education on this, please, and better yet, include the uncertainties, including the more severe but less likely outcomes, and the social effects of those physical changes. That has brought so, us beyond the end of the um, three minutes set aside, unfortunately. If you just had... I had one sentence. I was going to say, if there's one concluding remark, <laughs> yeah. So a bolder, more comprehensive strategy to integrate future food, work, housing and transport with integrated mitigation and adaptation on all fronts. Fast, because we've left it so late. And it's a big task, but that's what the physics and the people and the biodiversity of the future call for. Thank, Thank you very much indeed for um, coming along this afternoon. That does bring us to the end of the, the three minutes, but thanks very much indeed for the time that you've taken talking to us this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so um, Carrie Hunter was the last one. From prior, so. My apologies for um, brief absence. Uh, Ross Huddleston from the uh, Greater Hornby Residents Association. Thank you. So I'm not avoiding you lot tonight. So <laughs> I think I got accused of missing missing the submission and then missing your um, Residents Association meeting because I wasn't well. <laughs> oh, these things happen. They do. <laughs> yeah, this is on climate change. I'll try and talk as quick as I can because it's a bit long. Thank you for the time to talk to you. We have to stop looking at the narrow picture and look at the whole picture. Climate change is very important. The facts show it's indeed well underway. The Larsen Glacier in the Antarctica is in virtual meltdown. The large ice flows are breaking loose. Icebergs are reaching New Zealand for some years, expected to get worse. Two degree temperature increase could see sea level rise up to Martians Road and major flooding to many highways, including that to Akaroa. Weather changes will happen with increased stormy conditions, including possible hurricanes and or cyclones, and increasingly severe storms. This will bring increased levels of aggregate down our rivers. Stop banks only work to a height of 17 metres. After that, they fail. Rising sea levels and severe storms, tsunamis, may exceed this height, and plans must be implemented to negate this the sooner the better. I've been through two floods. Both occasions the water appeared first from underground, later through breaches. In Tuatapu, the 84 flood first came up through the drains as the gates on the drains became blocked. Then as a wave, approximately 200 millimetres high through the bush from behind my house. The Clutha flood in 57, however, was much worse. And that large holes burst up from underground at the showgrounds. This was past the stop banks, like boiling porridge, and then proceeded to flood the area. If anyone stepped on one of these, it could have been fatal. The new Brighton, Marsons, Brooklands area should be treated carefully as this area becomes, becomes affected, as the ground structure is not too different. This city has a history of building on marshy type ground, maybe because it's easier, but this will not help as sea level rise happens and groundwater rise accordingly. We even have a company talking of building housing in a gravel pit when they've finished extracting gravel from it. This may help in nor'westerlies, but who's going to supply the gondolas as the water inevitably rises? The airport at Terrace should not go ahead. It's on record that excess of 200,000 tonnes of carbon are released into the atmosphere on a yearly basis by the aviation industry and it would be economically irresponsible to divert tourists away from Christchurch businesses to a different destination. The Alpine Fault will also have a huge impact when it lets go on our city's climate. Up to and possibly over four minutes shake is expected, which will more than likely see significant liquefaction on land built on. The Hui Nui News in the late 90s ran several articles to the effect that all land east of the northern motorway could subside to below sea level. This reason alone, building on low-lying or swampy land should not be occurring, especially in light of the evidence regarding sea level rise and available solid ground immediately to the west of the city should be reserved for building housing on. 
really realise as little council can do about this, apart from rezoning in some ways, as developers, should they not get the land parcel they want, are not afraid to take councils to court, often at the council and ratepayers' expense. However, they will be nowhere to be found when the land subsides and will be left to the government and the ratepayers to pick up the pieces. Further concern is the fact that destruction, significant destruction will happen in the hills and that aggregate has to go somewhere. In our case, it would be straight down the WIMAC to the city. Behind or with the aggregate will become the floods. Professor James Brassington of the University of Canterbury recently confirmed the Dart and Rees rivers are rising rapidly. The WIMAC being of a larger catchment is probably increasing at an even greater rate. For this reason, gravel extraction should be coming from our rivers and not destroying good, solid ground beyond repair and creating a lunar landscape in its part, place. Since the earthquakes, we've seen a large increase in the deliberate destruction of valuable land for a once-in-a-lifetime use by quarry operators, when the aggregates should be coming from renewable sources, namely the riverbeds, or alongside to establish a flood channel instead of increasing stop banks at which only restrict flooding and not ground penetration. For this reason, the GHRA have requested all data regarding the exit cross-sectioning of the WIMAC from 1990 for studying and analysis from ECAN. In short, it's time to uh, put the thinking cap on, stop destroying good, valuable ground, move quarrying to where it will do the most good for the city, help save it from flooding, by the good practice of creating flood channels and looking seriously at how to address the issue of sea level rise in the east. One of the big concerns I have, that's my speech, but one of the big concerns I have is the sewerage ponds. The sooner they are shifted or looked at being shifted, the better. We don't want to wait till after they're flooded. Thank you. Thank you, and that just um, brings you fully to the five minutes, so thank you very much for um, making your presentation and to give your own personal experience of um, various events in the past. Uh, sometimes we, we, we don't uh, look to our history and are uh, therefore condemned to repeat it, I think someone once said. so. It, it was quite unique to see these big bubbles of ground lifting up and then the water just bursting through, yeah. and yeah. that's possible here. It is, absolutely. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, apparently we've uh, come to the point of a break, um, which we just had, but I don't think anyone else is here for their submission, are they? No. So um, we'll adjourn until uh, 10 past three. Thank you.
um, think the we haven't had um, Andy Buchanan. Kia ora Andy and welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm here to make a submission on the to draft Christchurch climate change strategy. And I'm going to say something about wood and wooden buildings. I had the pleasure of being with a number of you a fortnight ago, three weeks ago, at the opening of the St Albans Community Centre. Wonderful day and a wonderful building. And I asked after the meeting, I, Honourable Mayor, I asked her why she hadn't said anything at her opening address about the carbon stored in the building. And she said, well, nobody gave me any information about that. So as you will see in my submission, um, I did a few quick calculations. There's 150 tonnes of wood in that building, and that would offset the emissions of about 150 tonnes of carbon dioxide, which is about a million miles of your passenger car. And my point here is that the City Council is already doing a great job in timber buildings. Um, we've got to do more. I mean, first of all, I'm going to say I'm not only, you can't solve your climate change problem with timber buildings. We've, the first thing to do is to stop burning fossil fuels. And that's far and away the biggest, and I'm totally encouraged that. But further down the track, um, timber buildings are, are worth doing something because really the, the draft climate change strategy which you produced is not about doing anything. It's about talking to people. It's about engaging with people. It's about um, discussions about what might be possible. What's going to be done and what has been done, it's very, very light. So what, what I'm here to say is that we have an opportunity in this town. Some of you may know, if you, if you look here, this children's toy that I've got here is, is a toy that I've shown many times because it demonstrates a kind of building that can be built out of wood. And this is a building technology that we developed at the University of Canterbury. It's got international patents. There are a few buildings around Christchurch that use this technology. There's the Young Hunter building down in Victoria Street next to Vic's Cafe. There's the uh, Wynne Williams building, the old St Elmo Courts next door, which uses this technology and it's got a hundred huge timber beams in it, which you can't see, and the Trimble Navigation Building down in Birmingham Drive. So the, the technology is there, and it would have been great if we could have rebuilt Christchurch in wood after the earthquake. What happened after the earthquake is that we demolished about 1,200 concrete buildings, and there was a great battle then between concrete and steel, and the wood guys were just newcomers. They didn't get a look in, but What's happened is that we've replaced a thousand concrete buildings with 900 steel buildings and 10 or 20 concrete buildings and half a dozen timber buildings. And what I would like to say in my submission is that if the council really wants to do something and be shown to be doing something and following on from what you've already done with the Mount Pleasant Community Centre and the St Baldwin's Community Centre is to adopt a, a zero embodied carbon policy. And this is mentioned three times in your strategy. It's a simple thing to do, just adopt a zero, carb, zero embodied carbon. In terms of precedence for this, um, New Zealand government in the days of Jim Anderton, you know how long ago that was, we, we did have a, a wood first policy in New Zealand, which was then copied by the Japanese and in British Columbia, they have a wood first policy in British Columbia. There's a wood first policy in the town of the city of Rotorua. There's a wood encouragement policy in the state of Tasmania. Now, most of those people did it because they're wood producing places and they wanted to encourage local industry. Um, we don't, what I'm saying here is you don't have to call it a wood first or wood encouragement policy. I can't see any reason why the city could not adopt a zero embodied carbon policy. Could be done next week. And as a result of that, there could be some instructions going to the 
capital procurement people in the council and the council architects, and something could be done. It won't solve the climate change problem, but it would make a real difference. Yeah, well, look, thank you very much. Thank you for your submission, and thank you for um, enlightening me. I managed to put the statistics into my mayor's monthly report um, just to highlight the significance of um, wood uh, in, in, um, in our civic building. So thank you very much for both what you do and also um, and committing to it at a time when we really needed it. And, uh, and um, I'm hoping that uh, your submission can find some uh, fruition in our thinking around the climate change strategy. So thank you very much. OK. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Brian Reid. Oh, sorry, where? Sorry, I, I, I missed a part of the meeting, so I do apologise. Sorry, Anne, Anne Wilson's here. Anne. Oh, sorry, okay, Anne Wilson. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share and... Um, have a look into your plan and to hear feedback. Um, I'm from a rural area in Christchurch and I just wanted to express some concerns we have about some of the proposals. Um, we're particularly upset about the significant drainage costs that are proposed um, for the value of our house and land. And um, in our area, we already have to pay for our own drainage, we have to pay for our own septic, the maintenance of that. Our last bill was $600 from having to fix a part on something and we've only been there for six years. So it's um, it's ongoing and um, things like pumping our own water, putting in our own, um, getting our own supplies, even though we are really close to, um, to the supply of um, council provision. But in your case, we're just slightly up so we have to pay for that ourselves. So we're thinking about adding things like drainage, which we really struggle to grow grass for our sheep and cows at the moment, as I'm sure you hear from several people and see around the countryside as you're flying in and out how dry it is. So the thought of having to add that onto our, our weekly and, and yearly costs and expenses is, is, is just really hard. Um, you know, we, we Kiwi folk that are trying to preserve the land and um, be sustainable and um, enjoy the green space and um, it gets more and more um, tricky to do that. And uh, yeah, just need to think, to think about the areas, for example, Yildhurst is like over the Waimak River, which has uh, got a lot of gravel. We don't have to dig too deep to find um, really great drainage, so we don't really have any issues with um, sides of the road and um, curbing and things. We don't even have curbs, we don't have footpaths out there. So um, just thinking of adding things like that extra 5% and then full amounts after three years and five years, etc. cetera, is, um, yeah, I was talking to my folks and they said, particularly it disadvantages people with fixed income. Like if you're retired out there, you've seen your family grow up and they're still coming back to visit. But actually, um, you know, your, your income on on um, the retirement pension, thank you, is that doesn't keep increasing. So um, when there's increased thing, factors like that, um, that, that makes it hard for people to stay in the country. And we really want to have people live in our green spaces, I believe, and to enjoy them and to be able to share them. Um, we don't want to be land banking them for people that just can afford to stay out there. Um, we want... We want our people to be able to have friends and family that live in the country that they can visit without being overinflated prices. My husband and I both work um, to be able to keep our property. We've got four boys that just love being in the space. Um, but it's even with the GV going up, we still have to keep paying higher rates. Uh, and we don't mind if we had lots of services, but at the moment we only get rubbish and all the lovely things that you provide in town, which we enjoy as well. But... Um, let's not just think that the rural people are rich and that they can afford to carry some of the costs of things that don't affect them and um, protect our lovely green areas and our, yeah, our spaces. Do you have any questions? 
th thank you. That's just come to the end of the time nicely. So thank you very much for taking the time to personally come in and make your submission to us today. Thank you. And just to say, um, we just we got the letter in March um, about the drainage plan, and um, I think it was the middle of May or end of May we had to have it in by. And most people I talked to, from sick aunties or being away or being out of town, hadn't had the chance to to respond to that. So my voice is um, a huge amount of voices. And even just in three days when I emailed some neighbours, I got 13 people that wanted to put their name on the bottom of my proposal as well. So yeah. I'm just to say that I it's a little bit wider than just my voice. I think the letter voice. Was, was, was an afterthought instead of an integral part of a preliminary process. So, you know, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Uh, the next one is uh, Brian Reid. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Fairly new to this, but um, yeah, the whole reason for, um, well, climate change is a thing, it's happening. Um, but what are the reasons for it? Um, all the evidence points to the fact that it is not CO2 causing it. Um, if you go back to the ice core records, every single time temperature leads CO2, so uh, it's well known that um, changing temperature will change the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. You cannot have the reverse happening at the same time because then you would have positive feedback and a temperature would just spiral to an upper limit and stay there. It could never come down. Whereas if if you actually expand out the, the graphs, you can see that temperature leads CO2. So when temperature is dropping, CO2 is still rising. So if CO2 can also cause uh, a rise in temperature, that temperature could not drop. It would have to pull back up again. Um, records from geology show that the CO2 levels have been roughly 17 times what they are today with roughly the same temperature. Okay. This, this is a diagram of basically temperature since we left the last ice age about 11,500 years ago. Um, there's a bit of a debate about that. There was also the younger dry ice um, period where the temperature really plummeted and so did CO2 levels. In fact, the CO2 got down to about 200 parts per million, but 150 parts per million trees die. Okay. Now, um, one, one odd thing is that the IPCC um, take as a reference point um, the Little Ice Age, which is basically the coldest point since we left the uh, last glaciation about 11,500 years ago. Is that actually an ideal um, period to actually be looking at? That's been, life was pretty miserable all around the world. Um, I don't think it's pretty particularly good. Now the ice core samples, um, they, they show a great trend, but um, there's large periods of 100 years or so that uh, the gases can, can move in and out of the, the ice before it actually, uh, in and out of the snow before it gets compacted to ice. So the absolute value of CO2 from the ice core records isn't particularly good. And from plants, stomata, um, basically pores in plants, when there's an abundance of CO2, um, they have less of these holes in the leaves um, because they don't need to breathe in and out so much. So it makes them more water resistant. Um, so they can actually handle drought better in warmer climates and if there's more CO2 they, they also grow faster. Um, so and plants in the market show that the CO2 levels have actually been higher than they are now in the last 2,000 years. It doesn't marry up with the um, ice record but that, you know, as, as I've indicated that the ice record is not great for because of the flow of gases in and out of the, the snow before it's compacted. 
I'm thinking you've you've come to the end of your time, but okay. um, you know it takes a lot of effort to put a submission together and then yep. come along and present in person. So I just wanted to acknowledge you and thank you for doing yep. that. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, thank okay. You. One thing is, don't get rid of your your warm warm gear. Um, because NASA are actually predicting that we're in for a cold spell. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, Eric Paulson. Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Emeritus at the University of Canterbury and uh, the Toko Living Laboratory. Um, my reading of the strategy as it stands is that it's not really a strategy, but a series of broad program areas. And I think it requires some work uh, to put into a more strategic framework. I've suggested um, five areas. I might just focus on the first um, two or three. I think, firstly, it really needs to take account of and be sharply anchored to the Council's own emissions targets which are 50% reduction by 2030, and I think, uh, is it um, net zero by 2045? And really, to, uh, I think the best way of doing this would be to, to follow the same sort, sort of mechanism that the uh, Climate Change Commission does and have a series of five yearly targets and mechanisms for assessing progress against those targets and means of adjusting policies and plans accordingly, uh, you know, according to um, how the, the process is actually going. So that's the first point, to anchor it very closely to um, Council's own uh, emissions targets. The second point is that I take it that the basis of a, a climate change strategy is to affect public behaviour. And I don't think we're going to affect public behaviour unless the public are absolutely central uh, to this strategy. At the moment, as I read it, it's an internal document which proposes beyond that the establishment of an expert group. I think having an expert group is fine, but I would really like to see some much broader deliberative mechanisms in here which engage the public through citizen juries or citizen assemblies or something of that sort, uh, which would have a lot of advantages in um, not only engaging people, but working out uh, collectively what might be actually um, uh, most effective. And I would like to say I think this city has a wonderful record of public engagement over the last 10 years, which we shouldn't be losing. And it's not just share an idea. It's also all the work that was done in the River Corridor, the Red Zone, um, by Regenerate Christchurch. And I think we really should build on that, on that. I think the last point I'll make is that the City Council itself has done wonderful work internally uh, um, to uh, get its own um, uh, climate house in order, as it were. And I'd like to propose that uh, the council acts as an exemplar organisation. Uh, by that, I mean one which uh, um, provides ideas and means of, uh, uh, of bringing emissions uh, in hand for other organisations, including um, workplaces, uh, industries, shops, and particularly schools. And I think we could employ the uh, energies of the climate strikers to um, much better effect if we think in terms of exemplar organisations. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Noda. Thank you very much. Um, we've, we've had some of the uh, young people who came here as part of the climate strike, and, um, and they um, made submissions and said it was the first time they ever had, you know, and it was... So absolutely want to engage yes. with them uh, while they're still at school, I think, is core critical to the, to the future of these conversations. But thank you very much. Your submission links very neatly into some of the other submissions that we've heard about offering relationship between, uh, with us and the University of Canterbury and, and Lincoln University as well. So um, certainly taking you up on that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think Elliot Hughes is here from... Oh, just oh right. Okay. So he's not. Um, and uh, so we've got uh, Tremaine Barr from Safer Technology Aotearoa New Zealand. Kia koutou. Um, let's have a look. <laughs> 
Um, I'm here representing Safer Technology Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, we were created in 2020 by concerned citizens um, to educate and advocate in the public interest about the safe use of technology. Um, in general, as an organisation, we agree with the uh, climate strategy of the uh, policy that the Council's got. However, we'd like to bring it to your attention that under Goal 3 and Programme 6, that the move away from resource-intensive and high greenhouse emission industries needs to include digital and wireless <coughs> technology, e.g. ICT, cloud computing and wireless 4G, 5G systems. Mobile smartphone use and infrastructure and data centres required to run them, both locally and globally. Um, so why is this? Behind each byte, we have mining and metal processing, oil extraction and petrochemicals, manufacturing and intermediate transports, public works to bury the cables, and power generation with coal and gas. Uh, this is from a French quote. As a result, the carbon footprint of the global digital system is already 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and its energy consumption rises by 9% per year. As such, our action point number one is to say the Council needs to develop a plan that moves towards economic transformation and innovation that is part of a sustainable climate future for Christchurch that does not include mobile, wireless, 4G and 5G systems. So why is this? You know, we've got 4G now and 5G coming. 6G is being technologically planned for and 7G is on the drawing board. And we have the Internet of Things. And this is going to mean a massive increase in wireless devices, um, all sending wireless signals back and forth to each other. Now, so lurking behind the threat, behind the promise of 5G, delivering up to 1,000 times as much data as today's network, is that 5G could also consume up to 1,000 times as much energy. And it's the same again for 6G and 7G. You're exponentially increasing the amount of power you need to power those systems. Um, as such, the 5G revolution that the cell phone industry is so proud about is likely to prove to be an ecological disaster that could easily wipe out the carbon emission savings of the Paris Accord. As such, we recommend there be a moratorium on the use and continued rollout of the 5G system in Christchurch as to such time it can be proven safe for the climate, people and the environment. The Council needs to help lobby central government to make this a reality. And in reality, this submission was a... Um, I repurposed it from the one I sent to the Government's Climate Change Commission. So we make similar points there as well. Um, so action point three, we recommend the Council follow a similar process to the French High Council on Climate and assess new mobile phone 4G and 5G technologies from a climate perspective, including the economic, financial, social, health, and environmental impacts, including the material footprint. And it's interesting to see that the French and European politicians really do take this seriously, and um, where it's something new here for us to consider. Now, it seems a bit of an oxymoron to say dumb, few, dumb phones are the smartest future for Gen Less, but um, in reality, the massive growth in the mobile phone industry over the past 25 years has led to a massive increase in greenhouse emissions to power. 4G system from 2014 onwards has helped facilitate this massive increase in mobile phone data use and the necessary servers, and this is only expected to increase massively again with the rollout of 5G. Because it's not just the phones we hold in our hands, it's what they connect to. And all the electricity it takes to send information back and forth in the servers and all the rest of it, particularly image and data and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of these servers, of course, are located in the cheapest locations, China, e.g. coal-fired power stations. And in our main submission, you see there's an article there on when the people talk about the cloud, they're talking about a cloud of coal gas. That's what the cloud is about. That's what the cloud is primarily powered by, coal-fired and gas-powered stations. So, action point four. The council need to directly address the fact that so-called wireless mobile technologies are increasingly contributing to global greenhouse gas emissions. In order to protect the environment, the council needs to do a full life cycle assessment environmental, climate and social analysis of how Christchurch can have a wireless communication devices without endangering the climate and environmental and human health. As such, we recommend the move to the new dumb phones and we recommend that the, the council, for example, could issue their own staff with dumb phones, save, save themselves a lot of money um, and keep them safe and the environment safe. Um, so, in the end, whoops, here. The, um, the Emperor's New Clothes. Um, the wireless digital economy is a climate fraud, and that's why I use the term the Emperor's New Clothes. 
it seems simple and it's flash and the young ones are well and truly addicted to the systems and you know, so was I for not so recently as well till I realized I needed to delete all my social media apps off my mobile phone and just keep it very, very simple. It's just to text and communicate. That's all I really need to do. I'm self-employed. I got rid of the emails from my phone as well. I didn't need it. 99% of the time, 1% of the time, I kick myself. Eh. But uh, the rest of the time, I'm fine. I keep it wired. I keep it on my laptop at home. So Stans has identified that the council needs to take into account the fact that mobile, wireless, digital economy is resource intensive in a high greenhouse emitting sector of the economy that is unsustainable for the climate. Just when we need to be moving as a society to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the mobile, wireless, 4G, 5G sector of the economy and its supporting ICT and cloud infrastructure is massively increasing its requirements for energy and massively increasing its greenhouse gas emissions, all of which will only make climate change worse. And that's basically the gist of our submission. Thank you. I think if we go back to the original figure of 4% there, um, currently I think it's estimated the global airline industry is about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And they're trending down. Oh, that was pre-COVID, obviously. Uh, obviously it'd be less now. But um, uh, the digital economy is expected to double, be double that, 8% within the next 10 years, if not earlier. And it's only going to grow from there and there as 6G and 7G kick in as well if that's allowed to happen. Um, so when it comes to um, um, carbon budgets and all the rest of it, the council is going to have to take into account not just as what's here, but also the services that are being used overseas in terms of the servers and all the rest of it that, that service our mobile phones at and our online computing services and stuff like that. So um, kia ora koutou. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, it's a, um, quite a unique submission in amongst um, all of the submissions that we've had. But um, a healthy reminder, um, I like your version of the cloud um, thing, because I do know that, um, that uh, the data centres use coal-based electricity, and it's, it's an issue that really doesn't get much of, a, much of a look in when you talk about other industries in the comparison. So thank you very much for your submission. It's been quite salutary and very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Got up. Um, sustainable Autotahi Christchurch, Joyce Yeager. Yeah, I don't know. Kia ora. Welcome. Thank you. Tanakoto Katoa, thanks for having me. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about our submission, which we're happy to do because this climate strategy is very important to us. We think it's inextricably linked to the long-term plan, and we hope it can be at the front of your minds and of real importance as you make decisions related to the long-term plan. SOC commends the Christchurch City Council for its goals around reducing our city's contribution to the global carbon emissions and strongly supports the principles listed in this strategy. The fundamental framework is very good and we need an action plan to go with it that includes tangible steps towards the goals that have been set. We need the council to show real leadership and act boldly in line with their 2019 declaration of a climate and ecological emergency. Strong targets and principles have real power when there is a clear pathway to achieve them. SOC feels that the council's sustainable procurement policy could play a larger role in minimizing council's own carbon emissions and could encourage others to take action. The Council and CCHL have an opportunity to greatly reduce the city's emissions by setting emissions expectations for contractors. For example, you can require large contractors to have in-house sustainability officers and environmental policies, which could then lead to more businesses placing a higher importance on environmental issues and outcomes. We also feel that any carbon offsetting that takes place should be within Canterbury and with native plants from local plant stock. When increasing tree cover across the city, native species should be used preferentially for their biodiversity benefits and because they are better adapted to local conditions and fire resistance. This will require planning and resourcing to make sure the quantity and quality of plants needed are available. Christchurch City Council already has an excellent biodiversity aware staff, especially in the park ranger service. Their expertise and willingness to partner effectively with the community is a positive feature of Council, and we thank you for this and look forward to supporting you in this excellent work. We would like to see more checks and balances related to climate impact incorporated into decision making, particularly with developers. Developers should have to make climate impact reports on each development, as well as their company overall. 
For example, this should include the impact of developments on our food security in the face of climate crisis. We know that the protection of elite soils, or those 5% of our soils that are best for growing food, which are lost once they're developed on, is, an, is important for food protection in the future. The need to critically assess where housing should be located goes beyond the need to produce food in a climate change future. All climate impacts and the wider needs of the community and our natural world need to be considered before we build. Climate change in the long-term plan require forward thinking that goes beyond developers' bottom lines in the next few years. And it's also very important that Naitahu and Tangata Fenua play a major role in these discussions. Climate change needs to be embedded in all of Council's public messaging. SOC also hopes the Chrysler City Council can use the 10-minute city lens in its decision making, which partners well with a robust climate change strategy. Since transport makes up more than 50% of our city's emissions, redesigning and reconfiguring our city to favor more walking, cycling, and public transport is essential. The dominance of cars, car parking, and roads needs to be reconsidered, and we hope the global conversations happening in this space can be central in Otatahi Christchurch. Christchurch City Council is in a great position to lead on many of these discussions working within the Greater Christchurch Partnership and supported by people in our community that are already discussing and working toward these changes. SOC believes this must include rail for our region and are encouraged by the discussions at every, le ugh, every level that are exploring railway options. We also hope that transitioning from petrol to electric vehicles is viewed as a transitional phase rather than a long-term solution. When we use a 10-minute lens, other options can be better appreciated. For example, e-bikes are becoming more and more of a feature here as they are used by more people. Building cycleway infrastructure makes the change to increase cycling much quicker, and we congratulate you on the vision you are showing in establishing the cycling network. It's also important that the cycling infrastructure can be viewed as safe to use from the community, particularly for children. We would also love to see additional secure bike parking, such as the Lockheed Docks that have recently gone in, in more locations in the CBD and in suburban areas. Ensuring secure and free bike parking for everyone is one small example of an action that can help us make sustainable transport more accessible and help uh, Christchurch meet our long-term climate change goals. We do not support the building of Terrace Airport. Instead, we encourage the building of a low-cost passenger train to central Otago, which over the long term would be a better use of resources and help us achieve our long-term climate goals. It would also have the added benefit of hopefully taking cars off the road and improving roadway safety for all of us. We want my generation and the generations growing up now and transitioning into adulthood to feel proud of Otatahi Christchurch and to be secure in their future. Christchurch has an opportunity to lead Aotearoa and the world in transitioning into a climate change and biodiversity conscious future, and we encourage Christchurch City Council to boldly implement concrete actions to achieve the goals laid out in the climate change strategy. That was perfectly timed. <laughs> thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next we move on to the um, Canterbury District Health Board and uh, Sandy Brinson is here who's um, presented in this submission today. Kia ora, thank you. Kia ora koutou. Yes, apologies. Uh, Dr Anna Stevenson tends to get distracted onto other more pressing issues at this time. So don't stress, it's nothing major with COVID. It's just your usual business. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here to present um, I think really what we wanted to do was come and support you. As you know, we have a really close relationship with um, the City Council and through our joint work plans, climate change is something that we've agreed to work closely on. So part of that is to say we in, in health are try, trying to grapple with the same issues that you are trying to grapple with and the councillors who are involved in around that know that we are not, we're not coming here as any model to, um, to be showing. We just want to be really good partners on this and I think the other thing is that you know this is a really it's a really great document in terms of the, the information that you you know and your, your objectives and all of the things that you're trying to do but none of it is going to happen by one organisation alone and um, while we like others want you to be more bold and um, push things a little further again we just want to say that we are we want to be part of that and we want to continue to support that Probably the piece that um, for us was missing the most was really understanding the co-benefits of climate change and health and well-being. Mm. So they're pretty they're pretty obvious. I don't think it was because people don't know them, but I think it's really useful for people to understand that. So if we have less cars, then people are, are moving more. Then our non-communicable diseases like diabetes, which is ballooning out of control, um, 
uh, are all going to be improved. Housing is another really obvious one. If we have really good warm homes, then um, they're not going to take as much heating and the materials, etc. And um, there, are, there are many, many examples. Air quality is it would be an, another really good one. So I think those co-benefits are really useful. I see a lot of people talked in their submissions about education. Um, and so showing people those co-benefits of, of climate change and health and well-being are really important. Um, I think the other thing was there's, there's a little bit of talk around Māori and the treaty and some partnerships there. I suppose within um, community and public health that you know the treaty's core to what we do and Māori having a really you know, front foot in these conversations is really important. And it's often interwoven with the equity conversation, but they're not actually the same thing. The treaty is the treaty, is the treaty and equity is about making sure that the, the services and the responsibility goes to the communities that need. And while they clearly overlap, they're not the same thing. So it's kind of a message that we're saying to people a lot at the moment. So I just wanted to, to um, pull that one forward as well. Um, and I think the other thing that we mentioned a little bit was around decision making and in the strategy you've talked about trying to have climate change um, as a part of decision papers that come to the council, um, kind of suggesting that that's fine but they have to have some weight and bearing when that comes, not just that they've been considered and also suggesting that equity comes into this. And I'm no expert in this space but you know, clear understanding that the effects of climate change are against a part of the population that is probably not going to be making the decisions. So that that mix has to come to um, you at the table, really. Um, and we're, we're there to help if there's a way to support that with the ways we've done before with some of the um, assessments and things that we've, we've done. It would be great to do something. Um, I think the, the final thing, in case there's any question, really, is that we didn't get to talk to the LTP again, just uh, people are a little distracted at the moment in the public health unit, but it would really good to see some funding and some priorities around this. It was hard to see exactly where that might have been, so apologies if it was there, but we, we couldn't um, we couldn't see it. And I just want to um, talk about what other people are saying around urban design and development. You know how supportive we are of the um, making an active walking and cycling city, and we know how difficult it is. So um, we really think that that is important as well. I think they are my main points. So, uh, kia ora, and thank you very much for your submission. And, and I should acknowledge that the Canterbury District Health Board is a member of the Greater Christchurch Partnership and a mm. great contributor there. So. Um, we, we value that, and I, I, I really enjoyed seeing the Barton and Grant health map sitting in the submission. And I think we should lift it out and put it into the into the strategy itself, just to remind us of how interconnected all these issues are. I think sometimes people do forget the health, the co-benefits, as you call them, um, mm. uh, because they are significant and. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say killing two birds with one stone because that probably isn't appropriate. But, <laughs> um, but, but the the benefits that we can get across the board in terms of health and well-being. Hmm. Yeah. Is there any question? Uh, Sam? Yeah, thanks very much for coming in. I guess in looking at the climate change and um, keeping things local on that, does the DHB have a particular view on sort of like the, that foreign oil pool, which has obviously been a, a local issue in terms of health and wellbeing? Not as a DHB. It's, there's probably work happening within the team at Community and Public Health locally right. with communities and so forth, but as a DHB, we don't have not, a, not a, particular a, okay. a specific position. No. Sure. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so the next one is... Oh, yes. Um, the uh, school... Uh, strike for Climate Auto Tahi, Cora Scott, Rata Eri, and um, Dev Pandya. Thank you very much for being here. Can I, before you start, can I ask you a question that I asked someone else? Have, have you or representatives of your organisation made submissions on a plan before? I know you've been in front of council before, but have you been to one of our plans? Or is this the first time? First long-term plan. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. Kia ora and thank you for your 
for taking the time to hear us. Our names are Cora, Dev and Rata from School Strike for Climate. A group of young people who are passionate about taking action against, uh, against climate change. We are grateful for this opportunity to highlight the changes in your strategy that we believe are necessary to combat climate change. We would like to mention that we feel that this plan is a positive first step on our journey to a sustainable Christchurch. However, a stronger stance must be taken. Firstly, we ask that the council make our emission reduction targets more ambitious. Our current goals do not properly tackle methane, despite being a significant contributor to our overall emissions. A response like the one suggested, suggested by the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees should be a bare minimum, bare minimum. Really, as a wealthy country, we have the responsibility to do more. However, our current goals don't even meet this minimal requirement. At the very least, we ask that Christchurch City Council adapt a target consistent with 1.5 degrees, a 1.5 degree world, by including methane in total emissions reductions target and ensure that Christchurch's contribution should reflect our wealth and privilege. We also expect to see a more comprehensive action plan which is well explained and easily accessible to the general public. We continue to encourage the development of alternative transport infrastructure, including the expansion of bike lanes, which are essential for students like us who rely on active, active and public transport to get around. We've discussed this point before, so we'll keep it short. However, this is an instrumental part of our submission. Not only will this lower public transport, uh, transport emissions, but it will become a flagship climate change project for Christchurch. The need for support, not only not, the need for support for not only an economic but social and cultural transition as people are forced to adapt and change due to the impacts of climate change must be addressed. Under projections uh, about the impacts of climate change by 2100, big business will not be the only ones needing support, but rather communities who are heavily impacted by climate change. In particular, lower income communities will not be as resilient, which must be acknowledged when considering where we uh, where where we di direct funds. This, this climate crisis requires the proper allocation of the council's resources to the com uh, communities who need it. Not only this, we must ensure the preservation of the fertility of our soil. The Ministry for the Environment in their 2018 report, Our Land, highlighted the reduction of fertile uh, soil throughout Canterbury. The many causes for this are agricultural practices, Im impacts enhanced by climate change, and urban expansion. Our land has significant value to who we are, and as young people, we hope to inherit the same fertile and healthy soils as you did. Therefore, we demand the council impose measures to take into account the fertility of surrounding soil when approving the expansion of the city. Through this, may we protect our fertile soil, and therefore, our life and purpose. Ko alte fenua, ko fenua o te ao. I am the land. The land is me. J.E. Townsend. We would also like to talk about accessing the submission process. We found that writing a submission required a lot of time and energy, making it harder for members of the community who work or attend school full-time to access it. This was partly due to the use of complex terminology and ideas that required research or background knowledge to understand. Using more basic language and simplifying the document itself would go some way to solving these problems. Adding more structure to the document would also help. Being asked to make a general comment on that huge document was intimidating, and I have friends who looked at that and decided it was too complex and difficult. To engage more youth in this process, the council could also provide teachers with information on how to make a submission and go to give to their students and visit more schools to work through the submission process. We do support your plan to collaborate with community groups, but remind you that a part of this must include highlighting youth voices and creating safe and accessible spaces for youth to share their ideas. We recommend that the council work with schools to set up student oriented groups that provide a space in which youth are empowered to take action. We also ask that you further involve youth by providing students with more education and clarity 
on both the science and the council's proposals surrounding climate change. Young people are the key stakeholders, the ones who will inherit our city, our country, and our planet. We cannot be ignored. Thank you. I'll just, uh, uh, Anne, I'll, I'll... Thank you, and um, absolutely agree with you. We've got to give opportunities for young people to have their voice. And I'm just wondering if you know about Te Pai which is the Youth Standing Committee that has been established here at Council for exactly that. And also, do you have contact with the Youth Council and Pilot? Because they are also advocating for young people, and they would be good people to to join to join with. So it's probably more of a comment than a than a question. Yeah. Um, we weren't aware of the first organisation, or I personally wasn't. I'm not sure about other members of our group. However, we have been to events hosted by the Youth Council and Pilot, and have made use of some of their spaces before, and. We definitely think that they would be great groups to associate ourselves with. Excellent, because they're represented on Te Pai Pikani and would be a good voice for you, a good channel for you. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I think um, the, the uh, what was it, the one, one school, no, sorry, what was the other group that came today? Sorry? One Schools Network. Yeah. Yeah, they silent, also. so... Um, I, I just think, you know, because it did occur to me that, um, and through some of the discussions that mm. we've had, is that it is very difficult to connect in with school students, even though they have the most obvious um, entry point and that they, they all gather together in the same place, um, you know, every day of the school year. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, a Anne is right, it, to, to pipe. Picardi was set up for uh, having a direct, you know, voice through into the council, um, but we need to face it outwards as well, and it needs to engage directly because I think young people talking with young people is going to be far more beneficial than, well, face it. <laughs> the one, and, and, but you see what I mean that um, that it's actually broadening the network through the standing committee that might be a way of um, bringing issues forward and and also simplifying the process. You've made a really powerful presentation on how challenging submission processes can be when you want it to be as open and engaging as possible, um, mm. and then when you hear the youngest group that come and submit uh, no actually you're not the youngest group that no. come and submit the foreign pool group I think one by a country mile but the essentially you, the, 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 the challenge that you've um, put to us is the one group that knows how to use the technology still found it difficult to, to um, uh, traverse so um, yeah you've, you've opened up a good challenge to us so thank you very much for your submission today thank have you have your time so, um, so we we uh, is Richard Suggett here yet? No. No. So um, it doesn't look as if the final group of we're slightly ahead of time, um, and it doesn't look as if our final group of submissions have submitters have arrived yet so um, how about we just take a quick you know say till 10 past four pop back then all right
Excuse me. Excuse me. Could councillors please take their seats? Thank you. So um, if councillors um, would like, uh, this, is, um, this is Brent Thompson, who's uh, presenting today, and uh, he's on page 87 of the submissions that we've got today. So, um, so that will make it easy for you to find. I've just, we've just changed the order of things a little bit. So um, I'll hand over to you, Brent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and councillors. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come here and speak today. My name is Brent Thompson. I work for a company called Transition HQ, which helps businesses and organisations make the transition to a low carbon future. As part of my work, I have been modelling different scenarios around the use of cars and alternatives for transport in New Zealand, and I would like to try to illustrate the importance of major and immediate action on the points set out in Program 7. The first slide shows where we are headed if we don't change what we are doing. The blue line represents the same historical growth continuing, and the red line represents the difference that electric vehicles would make if market share continues to grow at around 20% per year. Basically, emissions still continue to grow until the late 30s and return to today's levels by about 2000. Next slide. The second slide shows the effect of the much more rapid uptake of electric vehicles, requiring a strong fear based scheme or similar. But we still have an increase in emissions between now and 2030 because of the growing fleet size. Sure, it gets better after that, but we can't possibly reduce transport emissions to the degree necessary without addressing the growth in the numbers and the use of cars. Next slide. So what if we, instead of growing the fleet, shrink it by 2% per year while still transitioning to electric vehicles at the same rate? This includes emissions from a mix of alternatives including new car share, electric buses and active transport. This is getting closer. A 33% reduction by 2030 and 75% by 2050. Further improvements require an even more aggressive reduction in vehicle numbers and all kilometres driven. Getting to net zero requires addressing manufacturing and energy related emissions at the same time and is even more challenging. Last slide. The point I'm trying to make is that cutting emissions is not easy. It requires a radical and immediate rethink of how we get around to reverse the current trend of ever increasing claims. Could a city like Christchurch really break this trend? Let's consider Copenhagen in Denmark. With a population of 794,000 in 2020, they have 675,000 bicycles and just 120,000 cars. It wasn't always this way. Bikes overtook cars just five years ago, in 2016. The city is designed to make active modes much easier and more convenient than using a car. This requires a massive change, not just tinkering around the edges with a few cycleways here and there. Can Christchurch become more like Copenhagen? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are you happy to take questions? Yes. Yeah. So, zero. Uh, thanks so much for your submission. Um, I'm just wondering if... Um, so sometimes we get uh, people saying that EVs are the answer, and your your clear answer to that is it's decreasing the the passenger kilometres travelled and the the size of the fleet that will end up making that work. Is that right?
electric vehicles are critical, but without reducing vehicles and kilometres driven, they won't achieve enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's uh, thank you. That's uh, extremely helpful um, to to really bring that together. So thank you very much for your submission. It's been uh, very very good to receive it and to hear you in person. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, uh, Richard Suggett. Kia ora, good afternoon. Kia ora, good afternoon everybody. Is there a, oh, there's the time. Three, go, okay. Right. Um, I generally support the four goals and the nine principles and the signs of success. Uh, however, the, the targets are too weak and the urgency of implementation in the strategy does not reflect the climate of urgency we are facing. Just as an overview, the implement, I comment on the implementation measures. I thought that many of them were often random or vague, insubstantial or timid, or tactical rather than strategic. Please complete the strategy in a way that assesses the risks, determines the outcomes, and has measurable and timely actions that create strategic change to match the threat that we are facing. I'll just comment on just a few of the programs in, in the time that I have available. Um, you have my submission, but I just want to reiterate, for example, on program five, carbon removal and restoration, I completely support indigenous planting and there are many ways the council can encourage it and work in partnerships similar to the adapting and green infrastructure where the Bixley corridor regeneration work is mentioned but it doesn't mention other areas. Um, but it's just more than planting and includes natural regeneration and weed and pest control and the council can provide strong incentives to landowners to encourage this. I'll just move on to program seven low emission transport system. Once again, I find this to be vague. Um, the next transport next step, if you compare that with the, my proposed amendment, in the next step it says it will just identify options. I suggest that should be complete the Christchurch transport plan to understand pathways to reduce emissions, refine options, and implement progressive measures to achieve the level of reductions we're seeking. I hope you understand the difference. There's options and then there's actually doing something. Um, in the last seconds, I just want to comment on the Terrace Airport. The strategy and target should also apply to CCHL. The recent council vote on a review of the Terrace Airport concept indicated, in my view, a lack of commitment to combating a climate emergency and is at odds with the council's transport goals. Tourism has been fundamentally reshaped by COVID and long-haul flights will be increasingly restricted by emissions reduction programs. Yet Christchurch Airport wishes to not only return to the status quo, but increase tourist numbers at the expense of the climate. The Council needs to make hard decisions to reject actions that perpetuate emissions growth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that, I mean, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so did anyone have a question that... I mean, you managed to do it succinctly within your thing, and your more more in depth submission is there. So thank you very much for right. coming That's the today. Opportunity. Thank you, uh, Rob Kerr from. No, he's not coming. Oh, he's not coming. So we should be up to. Yeah, uh, Wu Wu Jong Jong Hu. <laughs>
Welcome. Thank you. There is a problem that I've noticed everywhere: plastic packaging, or should I say, plastic overpackaging. Ready-to-eat foods and other products in the supermarket are almost all wrapped in plastic and overpackaged. Have you ever seen fruits each in a plastic sticker with some foam wrapping inside of a huge non-recyclable box? Well, that's a shame. Many other necessities are also overpackaged, from toothpaste to stationery to toilet paper and clothes. If you go to the supermarket now, you find it really hard to buy things sustainably packaged. Unlike other types of packaging, little, if any, plastic wrapping can be used for another purpose. So, how can we solve this problem? Well, the government, the citizens, and the manufacturers all have the responsibility. People should carry their own <clears throat> sustainable bags. They should choose to buy properly packaged foods to push the boundary. The government needs to regulate the manufacturers and educate the consumers so they can opt for sustainable packaging for their products. But mainly, it is on the manufacturers to change the way they are package, packaging the products. Actually, most of the packaging should be and can be reduced very easily. For example, biscuits are wrapped in a plastic bag and then in a, a cardboard box. The easier way is to just use a box made of recycled paper. And for foods that apparently have to use plastic bags, we can just replace them with biodegradable bags, like the ones we use in our organic bin. These small changes can make a big difference. I love Otahi Christchurch, and I've lived here ever since my family moved to New Zealand in 2015. I believe that Christchurch can address the growing threat of plastic overpackaging. I have taken the first step in sharing my concern, but now it is up to you. And all of us to stop this threat from harming our beautiful environment. Thank you, um, Tim. Thank you. Um, and you, you left out the importers because they're the ones that bring it in. But with, with regards to Germany, for instance, if you have a package, if it's up to a certain amount of packaging, it goes into a higher tax bracket. And also, you have the right in a, in a, in a shop in Germany if you buy your product. That you can actually unpack it there and leave the rubbish, if you like, the packaging for the shop to get get to、uh, pay to get rid of. What are your thoughts on both of those? Well, I think wait. So, are we doing this or not in no. New Zealand? We're not. Well, I'm just asking. What What would your thoughts be on that? Because no one's mentioned that at all, and it's a, a process in Germany that seems to、uh, to make the importers and the shopkeepers think twice. That's all. I think that's. Um, well, it has to be through legislation, of course. But I think that could work.、Mm. Thank you. Oh, look, thank you very much for your submission.、Uh, Jimmy Chen is—he's、um, going to not forgive me if I don't allow him to ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Carly, teenager. Yeah. Year eight. Yeah. Where we go? Where we go? Fantastic. There you go. The words of encouragement, but I'll, I'll add my words of encouragement too. There is nothing that frustrates me more than taking my、um, bags to the supermarket, which I do, you know, all the time now. I've managed to create a habit, which is the key to it.、Um, I walk in with my bag, and you can't buy the thing you want to buy because it's in plastic. So I am so with you, and、um, I think it is、um, central government, local government, and community. I mean, we have to demand at the supermarkets that we don't want to buy it with all the plastic. So,、um, all of us working together can make that difference. So, thank you very much for making the time to come and make a submission, and for making such an impactful submission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Grogan. Kia ora. Kia ora and welcome. Thank you for having me.、Um, I'm not an expert on climate change or, or an expert on the solutions,、um, but I believe the experts do have the answers for that.、Um, so my submission, I really chose to pick what I do on a daily basis as a 
working and living in Christchurch. Um, yeah, and the, so the exam, one of the examples I used was my workplace that was down by Moore House. Um, on a lunchtime, we would often go out and buy food, buy sandwiches, that, like most people do. And I found it incredibly alarming that a colleague of mine found it safer, quicker, and easier to use his three-ton Ford Ranger to go out and buy food to come back to the office to eat it, as opposed to me, who would walk. And that, no, it's true. He, he would get back to the office quicker than me, and often in a, in a lot safer manner, because and the roads around that area, it was so difficult to cross. It was dangerous. It was time-consuming. Um, and I would hate to think anybody with any mobility issues would have to take that journey too. And I just think there's some very easy levers there that can be pulled in terms of prioritizing pedestrians over cars. Very cheap implications, uh, implementations that around zebra crossings. And um, yeah, so that's, that was one of my uh, daily experiences. Um, another was um, I cycle to work, and um, I've noticed if, uh, at the moment there's a, um, a proposed um, pilot cycled in on Ferry Road around our college area, um, which is good. You know, I think it's it's a great move in the right direction. However, an element of that proposed cycle lane still says to me the car is king because there's an element of the lane where as a cyclist you have to stop and turn onto unmanaged traffic, cars going back and forth, and the cars have the right to wait again. And I find it just a little bit worrying that that's the direction we're heading in. It's a it's a cycle in, but still the car has priority. And I just think before we, um, for in order to to increase public um, pedestrianisation and reduce car usage, we need to um, revisit who has priority. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, pretty spot on as far as. Um the car. Which end of Mohouse Ave are you on? Um, it was just on the the south side of Mohouse House, so it was just outside of the um, the city. So it was uh, Montreal with um, yeah Montreal with Mohouse Ave really. So moving anywhere it be within walking distance of the Metro Sports facility is what I'm saying. Yes, that's so right. All of you and your mates are going to be able to go down there and get your lunch there and have a uh, a swim as well. Yeah, but even. <laughs> <laughs> down from there all the way to Colombo Mall, it was just, you know, it's 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 really there's no pedestrian crossing whatsoever. No, no, it's yeah, I know the area you're talking yeah. about very well. Yeah. And clearly, it's a very small micro or nano picture, if you like, but I think that just reflects the aspirations of the city. Yeah, I mean, it's clear when we hit the 30k, you know, where where the you know the priorities are starting to lie, but. Mm -hmm. Out there, outside of that, not Aaron. Yeah, where was the issue down by Ara? Which which lane is it where you have to stop? Um, so it's uh, where Ferry Road meets Saint Asaph. Yeah, it's a dreadful corner. The, you know the corner. There's, right by there's by the big numbers. Yes. Yes, gotcha. that's right. Okay. So, so there's a pilot. Sorry. Timeless. Yeah. So there's a pilot cycle lane that's been put in there, and the council's cu currently still taking. Um, um, feedback on that. It's been put in temporarily. It's a temporary one to get. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. the one on Ferry Road. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So for the colours and things. Yeah. And that. I think it's part right. of the colours and, the, yeah. and there's, there's planters. And, yeah. But at one point in there, you have to cross that road to go to the other side to cross Fitzgerald. But that the, all the cars there have priority. There's no managed crossing there. Oh, is there no traffic light for the bikes? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a temporary. It's a temporary, it's a temporary no, no, transition, no. you know, to check out the the. Oh, crossing ferry road. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it thirty k? Oh. No. I'm dis I'm disappointed, David. David, I'm disappointed that you didn't focus. What you are focusing on is the fact <laughs> yeah, that you're, you're, say. you're spending money on zebra crossings and so on, which is all well and good. But we could save money. And your other point about reducing the grass and verge cutting and replace with wildfire, wild fly, flower. I've been eating some. Um, <laughs> planting. So I want to see you promote that or, or 
um, advocate for that more strongly next time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's another yeah. conversation. Uh, I, I knew it, I knew exactly yeah. what he was going to say because I was actually looking forward to you touching yeah. on that yeah. part of your submission as well. I'm sure you guessed I'm not from from New Zealand, but there's there's um, examples in England with uh, significant savings for, for local authorities in, yeah. in cutting those grass verges. I was trying to say the wild would weed, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you haven't been partaking of that. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And um, we have um, Freya Volkus, is it? Volkus? Volkus. Thank you. Andrew. Well, Andrew said, first and foremost. Um, but I do think that the plastic shouldn't be there to begin with, so mm. we shouldn't have to get rid of it. It seems a bit strange that uh, for so long we've been talking about single-use plastic, and uh, I thought it was supposed to be banned. Yeah, we got it. And out it hasn't of, been. We got it out of the carry bags, and then it's still in everything that you buy. It's on every yeah, Ridiculous. and everything else. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's a little disappointing, seeing as that we were told that that would happen ages ago, ages and ages. Um, I am here to talk briefly about Faranui Swimming Pool and the art gallery. So for I'm here um, just saying that Faranui Swimming Pool. I've come from somewhere that does not have a swimming pool. Um, and the complications... Oh, it was Wahiki Island, so we didn't have one all year round. Um, so the complications for children learning to swim in a, a very small country that's surrounded by so much water uh, was a massive problem. Um, and... What I found at Faranui Pool is that it kind of, it creates communities because the children know the staff because they do their swimming lessons there and they feel very comfortable. So for their activities, they can walk there and they can safely go there and you know that the staff will look after them. Um, from my experience, they know them by name, which is really important. Um, and they get to talk to grown-ups and they get to talk to high school students. So they get those community links. Uh, I don't see how it would take away from the large pool, um, but it does, um, it would take a huge um, focus away from the community. And I went in the holidays and I was surprised at how much it's used and by sort of a very, very wide range of people. Um, also, one thing I was was going to say but it's gone from my head now I might come back you never know um, just how important it is and how it brings people together and especially with the um, the basketball and the, the area on the side as well it just brings so many different groups together and my children can now nearly learn to swim which is fabulous but it needs to be everyone needing to learn how to swim uh, if we move on to the arts project, um, lockdown highlighted how important the arts were and when the world is unsure of what is going to be available to our children, we don't know what jobs are going to be available, surely creative thinking is key. Within the school curriculum, we don't have time for that, so they need an outlet and it is exceptionally important that they can play and they have that freedom to have a lovely time regardless of how much money they have and how motivated their parents are to take them. Um, within school, we don't have time to teach these elements. Um, these experiences open children's minds and collect, connect people from all walks of life. Um, and Wednesday is brilliant. It connects such a diverse range of people uh, and ages and the children get to speak to artists, so they're not this pie-in-the-sky sort of magical thing. They're actually real people. Also, ironically, as I come up your stairs, you have the most beautiful art pieces. Um, not all students are, or not all children who use the art programme are going to be um, creating things like that. But given that opportunity, they may be able to see solutions to the masses and masses of cars we're going to have to dispose of once the world goes electric. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, submission. Do you have notes? 
Look, thank you very much. It's thank much you. appreciated. Thank, and you. thank you for your response to the earlier question as well. <laughs> thank you. Right, that is the um, uh, conclusion of the um, meeting today, and I'm going to adjourn the meeting to 1 o'clock tomorrow, Friday, the 21st of May, where development contributions are the order of the day. Andrew Turner will be in the chair tomorrow, as um, I shall be in Wellington for the National Council of, the, of Local Government New Zealand. So, well... I asked for it, so. Um, sorry? I'll, I'll, I'll just adjourn the meeting now until um, 1 o'clock, Friday, the 21st of May. Thank you. Yes, thank you.